Good afternoon, everybody. I think that I can interpret the feeling of the vast majority of all of us uh, in thanking uh, Franco for the extraordinary organization of this meeting and even the little misunderstanding with the people that control the weather was, was a minor one. So what I'm going to do in the next 20 minutes or so is just a, a brief overview of what has been uh, one of uh, the main topic of my work over the last 30 years, actually probably 40 years. So. Um, and in particular, the mechanism and uh, physiological and physiopathological role of calcium handling in uh, living cells. We are all, you're all aware of the importance uh, of calcium homeostasis uh, in uh, cell life. The control of calcium, the extrusion of calcium from the cytosol is a very early event in eukaryotic cells and has been maintained throughout evolution from yeast to uh, human cells. This control is essential because uh, the <coughs> alteration in the permeability of the membrane uh, of the plasma membrane leads to a calcium flood into the cells and uh, the, the death of the cell. The cell have taken advantage, however, of the gradient of calcium, the enormous uh, electrochemical gradient across the plasma membrane and across the membrane of some organelles uh, to use calcium as an ubiquitous uh, signaling pathway. And uh, <coughs> The language of this uh, signaling system is taking care of the amplitude of the calcium signal, of the frequency of the calcium oscillations in the cytosol or within organelles, uh, uh, the localization of the calcium signal that can occur in specific site of uh, the cell or of the intracellular organelles. And last but not least, um, the timing of the signal, the duration of the signal. In this slide, can I, I just indicate the uh, processes, some of the processes, practically there is no process within the cell that is not modulated, if not controlled by calcium. And it goes from uh, neuroexocytosis down to fertilization, proliferation, and cell death. And it occurs uh, on a time scale that is <coughs> spans over six orders of magnitude from the microsecond event, that is the neurotransmitter release, uh, to something that occurs in the times of hours or weeks uh, as uh, the fertilization and proliferation. And I remind my students, so when I talk about that, that all of us uh, sitting in this room are the result of a calcium wave because the first event occurs in mum's oocyte when it was hit by dad's spermatozoa was a rising calcium in the fertilized egg and that prevented polyspermia and activate the first <coughs> division of that cell. Of course, it would be too long and too boring to talk of the different uh, uh, mechanism that control calcium, and I will concentrate on my beloved and hated organelle that is the mitochondrion. And mitochondria has been at the center of the uh, calcium signaling pathway since a long, long time. The first description of the capacity of mitochondria to accumulate calcium in, a, in an energy-dependent way goes back to 1961, and some hints even before. So we are at the same time when uh, Asselbock and collaborators discovered that, that the sarcoplasmic reticulum of muscle cells were capable of accumulating calcium. And uh, in the 60s and, eight and 70s, uh, the calcium uh, capacity, the capacity of mitochondria to accumulate calcium within their matrix uh, was um, the focus of uh, an, a, number, a very large number of investigations. And the basic principles were firmly established based on work in isolated organelles. Essentially, <coughs> it's uh, composed of uh, two major pathways. 
a calcium influx pathway, presumably a channel, and now, now we know it is a channel that drives the, to the divalent cation, two positive charges, into the matrix driven by the membrane potential generated by the respiratory chain. So there is not a pump, but is a membrane potential driven accumulation of uh, the cation. And then two system to extrude calcium from the, uh, from the uh, matrix, uh, a calcium <coughs> sodium exchanger and calcium protein exchanger that are essential for the survival of the cell and the survival of the mitochondria because otherwise calcium will go into electrochemical equilibrium and that will be incompatible with uh, the life of the cell. But, but there is a but. The but is that, that <coughs> while this was firmly established, it came out that the so-called inverted commas affinity of the calcium uniporter for calcium is too low to be physiologically relevant because under physiological condition, the affinity of this system as a KD, an apparent KD of something like 20 to 30 micromolar, that is enormously higher than the <coughs> bulk calcium, cytosolic calcium rises that occurs under physiological condition. And therefore, for over a decade, the vast majority of us, including myself, thought that calcium in the mitochondria was uh, primarily a, <coughs> an interesting laboratory artifact, uh, and uh, only under some extreme condition of calcium flood into the cytosol, the mitochondria will come in and take up what uh, just trying to save the cell. This was the situation until the 90s. Uh, at the beginning of the 90s, we did an experiment uh, uh, based on uh, a new uh, discovery, so the establishment of the first genetically encoded calcium indicator, that is a protein produced by this beautiful uh, jellyfish, Aquora victoria, that produces a protein named aquarin, is a photoprotein that reacts to calcium binding to, three, uh, to the three uh, EF binding sites uh, that it contains with the emission of a photon. And um, by transfecting cells uh, with uh, a mitochondria targeted equoring, we <coughs> could find something absolutely astonishing for that time, and now is well established. And that is that, that rather than being very lazy at taking a calcium under physiological condition, if cells were challenged with a stimulus, for example, and this were a HeLa cells uh, challenged with histamine that releases calcium from the endoplasmic reticulum via IP3 channels, uh, the rise in calcium within the mitochondrial matrix was much larger, 5, 10, in some cases 50 times larger than that occurring in the cytosol. And this was not predicted because the rise in calcium concentration in the cytosol well, well below the KD of the calcium unit What is the explanation of this uh, strange phenomenon? The explanation, uh, the <coughs> proposal that we, we made at that time is that rather than being exposed to the bulk cytosolic calcium concentration, that is the one, two micromolar rise, uh, the uh, mitochondria get very close to the calcium channels of the endoplasmic reticulum, and therefore locally they are exposed to a microdomain of high calcium, much higher than the bulk calcium levels, uh, and therefore the low affinity calcium uniporter for a short period of time takes up calcium and then diffusion takes care that the accumulation of calcium in the mitochondria is not in excess. And this was a model based on uh, a number of indirect um, uh, experiments uh, and it took us uh, over something like uh, 20 years or 15 years uh, to demonstrate that indeed such microdomains are indeed generated on the surface of mitochondria. There are <coughs> morphological evidence that such microdomains can be generated, potentially can be generated. For example, this uh, is uh, electromicrographs uh, uh <coughs> reconstitution that show how very often the endoplasmic reticulum membrane gets close to the, plasma, to the mem outer member of the mitochondria at a distance of something like 10, 15, 20 nanometers. And it's clear that if there is a calcium channels here that 
a trend that allows the efflux of calcium from the endoplasmic reticulum for a short period of time in the vicinity of the mitochondria, the calcium levels will be very close to those occurring, uh, existing in the endoplasmic reticulum, so in the 100 micromolar region. However, uh, for sometimes, uh, uh, for a long period of time, the uh, capacity to monitor calcium in these selective regions, in these hot spots close to the membrane, the outer membrane of the mitochondria, was prevented by <coughs> experimental difficulties. We could not put an indicator there that could measure quantitatively, dynamically, in a living cells what was occurring. And uh, luckily, a few years later, GFB was discovered. And this is uh, a, a paper I'm very proud of because it's the first demonstration that GFP can be expressed in a mammalian cells and not only in the mammalian cells, but within an organelle of a mammalian cells and in particular my uh, beloved organelles, the mitochondria. So these are just uh, little movies that show that people were measuring calcium in very, very different uh, uh, cell types from cells in culture to cardiomyocytes in culture, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, the key point in measuring calcium in these hotspots came back uh, about three to four years ago when we put an, a calcium indicator, say GFP-based calcium indicators that allows the, the measurement in single cells uh, on the outer surface, uh, <coughs> on the cytosolic surface of the outer mitochondrial membrane. And in those, in those conditions, we could measure the existence, the formation of uh, hot spots. These are shown here in this uh, 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 tall pyramid, red pyramids. Uh, of concentration of calcium in the region of 20 to 30 to 50 micromolar that are <coughs> generated close uh, on the outer surface of the, of the mitochondria, close to where the um, endoplasmic reticulum is located. And this is not uh, something that occurs in uh, cell lines, but even more and more dramatically, for example, in these experiments, this is a, a cardiomyocyte in culture, and you see how many hot spots are generated uh, uh, close to the mitochondria under those conditions. To cut a long story short, mitochondrial physiologically, mitochondrial calcium uptake can regulate a variety of uh, cellular functions. And here I listed a small number of them, the most popular one. Mitochondria can take up calcium from the cytosol and therefore they can act as calcium buffers. So they reduce the amount and the peak level of calcium in the cytosol that are generated either by opening of calcium channels on the plasma membrane or by releasing calcium from the endoplasmic reticulum. They are essential, these calcium rises in the matrix are essential to activate mitochondrial metabolism. It's well known there are three key enzymes of the <coughs> uh, Krebs cycle that are calcium activated, pyrodehydrogenase, oxoglutarate dehydrogenase, and, and another one that I never remember. Uh, <laughs> And uh, the activate these enzymes are essential because are the limiting the rate limiting step in feeding electrons to the respiratory chain. So if calcium goes up in the in the matrix, uh, these enzymes are activated, more electrons are feeded into the respiratory chain, and more ATP can be uh, can be produced by the mitochondria. And this is uh, said the, in the third one. Uh, there are some specific function in some cells. For example, the uh, calcium levels in the mitochondrial matrix is essential in aldosterone, uh, in the aldosterone production in uh, glomerulosa cells, and it plays a key role, for example, in the modulation of insul insulin secretion and many, many others. But there is a but again. Cell stimulation gives rise to a calcium release from intracellular stores or activation of calcium influx uh, through the plasma membrane channel. This uh, results in mitochondrial calcium uptake and this uh, stimulates organelle function. But as any good thing, let's, let's think of yesterday night, 
a good glass of wine is fine for you, too many glasses of wine are bad for you. And in fact, too much calcium in the, in the mitochondria is capable of activating a series of disastrous effects for the cells, uh, culminating eventually in, uh, uh, in the death of the, of the cell itself. And uh, we are all known, uh, we all know that uh, the process of uh, uh, programmed cell death or apoptosis can be activated uh, due to a damage of, uh, um, by calcium of uh, the um, of these organelles, the release of apoptotic factors, et cetera, et cetera. An enormous interest has also been uh, dedicated over the last few years uh, to the role of calcium uh, in uh, uh, neuropathology. It's been uh, is an established fact, for example, the concept of excitotoxicity, that is the mechanism through which in excess calcium accumulation as it occurs when uh, too much calcium, too much glutamate is released uh, by damaged neurons, uh, uh, that uh, the flooding in, uh, of calcium into the cytosol is taken up by the mitochondria, the mitochondria undergo uh, a permeability transition, release of apoptotic factors, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, more interesting and more debated and fine is the possible role of uh, mitochondrial calcium uh, dysregulation in some uh, neurodegenerative diseases. Um, for example, we have been interested over the last years uh, in some models of Alzheimer's disease, and in particular, some forms of familiar Alzheimer's disease, those due to mutations in a ubiquitously expressed protein such as presenilates. Presenilates are protein that are part of the uh, gamma secretase complex, the one that uh, releases the beta amyloid beta fragment uh, from amyloid precursor protein. They uh, presenilin have a, a key role in a number of uh, uh, physiological processes, duty embryogenesis, et cetera, et cetera. They express in every cell in the organism, but some mutations in either presenilin one or presenilin two are responsible for the very few cases of the so-called genetic inheritable Alzheimer's disease. And there are a number of evidence in the literature indicating that presenilin, among various other things, uh, can regulate calcium homeostasis or some aspect of calcium homeostasis. So we got interested a few years ago in looking more deeply in uh, uh, what presenilin uh, does, and in particular, we discovered that presenilin 2, but not presenilin 1, is capable of increasing the efficacy of calcium transfer from the endoplasmic reticulum to the mitochondria. In this plot, what I did, I plot the, the increase maximal increase in cytosolic calcium and the relative increase in the mitochondrial calcium. And the blue uh, squares are the control or the green squares are PS1 uh, transfected cells. Uh, and these are different mutation in PS2. And what you can see is that for the same increase in, uh, in calcium concentration in the cytosol, the, uh, the rise in mitochondrial calcium is significantly larger in the mitochondria expressing presenilin 2 than presenilin 1 or in control. What is this due to? It's a long story. I have no time to describe it. But what we found is that presenilin 2 makes <coughs> increases the number and the length of uh, the uh, narrow apposition between mitochondria and endoplasmic reticulum. So favoring the vicinity of the mitochondria to the uh, calcium release sites and therefore the chronic transport of calcium from the endoplasmic reticulum onto the mitochondria. This is another example. These are measuring the hotspots on the surface of a, spread of a cell expressing a mutated form of presenilin compared to a control cell. And you see that the hotspots are much uh, more abundant in, uh, in the cell expressing presenilin 2, and this is a quantitation of the data we are not interested in. This is not true only for transfective cells, but it's true for cells uh, expressing presenilin, uh, uh, for neuron expressing presenilin. You see that, again, for the same rise in nuclear calcium, the surrogate of uh, the rise in cytosolic calcium, 
the rise, and mitochondrial calcium is significantly larger. And more recently, we repeated the same experiment in uh, neurons from transgenic mice, expressing the human mutation, um, the Alzheimer's human mutation in presenilin 2, but not the presenilin 1 uh, results in the same uh, increasing in vicinity of mitochondria to endoplasmic reticulum and increased transport. So what we think that a component, I'm not saying the cause, but a component in the toxicity of the expression of this protein is a chronic excess transfer of calcium from the endoplasmic reticulum onto the mitochondria. All this is fine. The literature on this uh, topic uh, is increasing tremendously, but for over 50 years, we knew absolutely nothing on the nature of uh, the uh, components of this calcium handling machinery of the mitochondria. We had no idea, despite the fact that very <coughs> prominent scientists and the people with, the, um, with white hair with me uh, will remember Ephraim Racker, Britain Chancellor, Albert Leninger, Ernesto Carafoli, and many, many others tried to identify which proteins were responsible for calcium transport and in particular for calcium uptake, the calcium uniport. And that escaped the um, discovery for 50 years. And uh, then uh, we rejuvenated, actually, not my group, but that of my uh, dearest friend, Sarino Rizzuto, uh, um, rejuvenated an observation made something like 35 years ago that yeast don't have the capacity to accumulate calcium. Their mitochondria, unlike that of any other eukaryotic cell tested so far, from C. elegans to Drosophila to humans to, to you, every beast you, you, you know, take up calcium, but not the yeast. And they use, therefore, a different approach. And uh, to cut a long story sh short, in particular, Diego De Stefani and Anna Raffaele in Sarino's lab, uh, um, by uh, making a, a sort of combination between uh, the mitocarta, so the, all the mitochondria produce protein, those that are producing in, uh, in yeast but not uh, uh, in, in mammalian cells but not in yeast, uh, et cetera, et cetera, they came out with 14 candidates. And these 14 candidates, some of them were protein known, uh, and uh, two of them were uh, of uh, no, uh, no functional role. And they <laughs> put their attention on this protein, a koi koi domain containing protein 109A, and uh, what they did, they found it is expressed in every, uh, in every organism, but in yeast, is expressed ubiquitously in all mammalian cells, has two transmembrane domains that are conserved that are the minimum to generate a calcium channel. And last but not least, when they overexpressed in cells, uh, they found that overexpressing it in the mitochondria, uh, they contain a, a classical mitochondria pre-sequence. Uh, the calcium rise uh, in the mitochondria in response to a cytosolic uh, calcium challenge was uh, uh, dramatically increased uh, in cells overexpressing the, um, um, the, uh, this protein that we now call mitochondrial calcium uniport. Uh, the uh, buffering capacity in the cytosol was increased and in fact is decreased in the cytosol. And they did obviously the opposite experiment. They downregulated NCU and they found that, that, that the calcium rise in the mitochondria was inhibited and that in the site it was increased. And exactly in parallel, another group in Harvard, that of uh, Vamsimuta, found exactly the same cells, the same protein, and found exactly the same results. So from 2011, we now know at least one component of the calcium uniport, and this component indeed is a calcium channel when reconstituted in uh, in lipid bilayer, you see these uh, uh, drops in the trace that are typical <coughs> uh, opening of uh, calcium channels uh, occurring in, uh, in, in, this, uh, in this preparation. If you block 
with a classical uh, inhibitor that is ruthenium red, uh, this, uh, uh, this opening are inhibited. And Serino and his co-workers went on and they uh, did also some uh, uh, modeling of uh, the structure of the uniporte that is uh, an oligomer and most likely a tetramer with uh, a, a, a pore in the, uh, in, in the center. This was a, a key discovery uh, and we were all happy with that uh, when, uh, uh, when it was found. But in fact, it turned out that the complexity of the machinery of calcium uptake is far more complex than we expected. In fact, there is a, a, te a tetramer made by MCU uh, unit, but there are at least two subunits, MCU1 and MCU2, that, look, that work as modulator of the calcium affinity. Essentially, MCU1 uh, increasing the affinity for calcium, MCU2 uh, decreasing the affinity of calcium. Then uh, another protein was discovered, it's called EMRE, that seems to be uh, essential for assembling the uh, uh, oligodomerization of MCU and, uh, and MIQ1 and MIQ2. And last but not least, uh, um, they, uh, a, another, another two proteins, one is not mentioned in this slide, uh, but one uh, uh, very important one is, uh, and that is MCUB. And this MCUB is not a, an alternative splice variant or an, a, an isoform of the MCU, but it's a, a dominant negative uh, subunit. So the control of this uh, uh, system uh, can be exerted either by varying the MCU level, the MCU1, MCU2, but also EMRE and MCUB. And uh, uh, additional data, there is no time to discuss and is not my data, multiple sites for regulating organella, calcium homeostasis, uh, mitochondria, including microRNA have been discovered and uh, uh, more, more uh, data are coming out uh, in the next uh, few uh, days or weeks. And last but not least, uh, I mentioned <coughs> some of the names uh, of the people that uh, over the years have collaborated with me at present uh, in my lab uh, and some key collaboration of, of my life. Uh, in particular, I want to mention Sarino Rizzuto, Roger Chen, Jacopo Meldolesi, and Manuela Zaccolo, and many, many others. And I wish to stress that the work on MCU, our original data from uh, Serino Institute's lab. And thank you very much you, for your attention. Thank you, Tullio, for this fascinating talk. Yes. Who regulates the level of expression of MCU and MCU? I wish I knew. Uh, I think MIRF25 is one of the MIRFs that uh, can modulate uh, the expression of uh, MCU. But uh, this is uh, still an open question uh, uh, that needs to be uh, further investigated, uh, and uh, that is not my job. And, uh, and are there some specific uh, transcription factors that might uh, regulate the level of of uh, I think uh, this is a work uh, that I'm not doing, uh, that is, has, been do, is, has been done, uh, is, is uh, in, in progress in Serino's lab, uh, the identification of uh, the promoter of uh, these, of MCU and of the other regulators uh, to understand which transcription factor is regulating uh, the expression level. The strange thing and the fascinating thing is that you can regulate not only the expression but also the activity by turning on a, a, a dominant negative endogenous inhibitor. Other questions? No, we just move on.
Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I want to thank Professor Salvatore for this kind uh, invitation, but uh, even more, I want to thank him for all the effort and patience he put in creating and growing change in uh, Naples. Thank you, Franco. Well, I want to tell you two brief histories that resume the work we made in the last 10 years. Once upon a time, non-coding DNA, when I was a student, it was called uh, junk DNA. It represents about 98% of the full genomic DNA. And uh, once upon a time, a baby whose skin tasted salty. He was bewitched and was doomed to an early death. Today, we know that uh, the junk DNA and uh, its relevant role in regulating gene expression, and we know also the alteration which may cause several human disease. So probably the term junk DNA is uh, not appropriate today. And uh, today we know that uh, the bewitched baby is affected by cystic fibrosis, which is the most frequent lethal genetic disorder among Caucasian. And uh, we know that also the term bewitched is not appropriate because we know that the disease is due to the alteration of a membrane protein, which is widely expressed at the apical side of all epithelial cells and is involved in regulating the flux of sodium and chloride across cell membrane. About 25 years ago, the cystic fibrosis transmembrane regulator disease gene was mapped, and up to now, about 2,000 mutations were discovered, but also using the scanning of the whole coding regions of the gene in cystic fibrosis patients, we are able to detect not more than 92% of mutations. In other words, there is a percentage of mutation that do not lie within coding regions. Going to the clinical expression of the disease, the alteration of the sodium and chloride channel causes um, higher density secretion, and this opens the way to bacterial colonization at pulmonary level. It may cause pancreatic insufficiency for the obstruction of pancreatic ducts present in 90% of patients and also intestine uh, occlusion, even in the first days of life, and the myriad of, adult, of other alteration, which render CF a systemic, chronic, and severe disease. But uh, in the last years, several milder forms of the, uh, of the disease, today known within the umbrella term of CFTR-related disease were discovered, they have a better outcome and frequently are identified in adult patients. Today we know that Friedrich Chopin was affected by one of these forms. So the question is to understand why in several cases we have a mild course of the disease at level of different tissues and organs. And when the gene was discovered, we thought that this could depend on the effect of the mutation. In other words, class one and class two mutation that completely abolish the protein at membrane level would be responsible of the most severe forms, while class three, four, and five that are associated to some residual activity of the protein would correspond to a less severe form. But this uh, simplistic genotype, phenotype view was confident by several studies, by our and other groups, that demonstrated a discordant expression in patients bearing the same genotype in pairs of affected CF patients, both at liver and pulmonary level. And this opened uh, the way to the hypothesis that the disease would be modulated by genes inherited differently from CFTR the so-called modified genes. But uh, 10 years of study on this topic, on modified genes, and more than a thousand of publications on this topic, permits us to conclude that each modified gene modulates CF clinical expression in a very small subset of CF patients. For example, this is one of the largest studies performed on modified genes this study started in Naples with several patients described by our group. 
and it was based on two cohort of patients for more than 2,000 2, patients. This study demonstrated that mutation within the serpin one gene may modulate liver expression in CF patients, but in not more than 2% of them. So at this point, we have two questions. The first one is to identify mutation in about 8% of CF alleles that do not bear mutations within the coding region of the gene, and to understand the molecular basis of the CF phenotypic heterogeneity. Our group approached to study the junk DNA, the CFTR non-coding regions, including the promoter area, intronic sequences, and the three prime untranslated regions. We studied a large group of patients, of CF patients with undetected mutations after the scanning of the coding regions of the gene, and a large set of patients with severe or mild clinical expression at pulmonary or liver level. The first study involved the 6KB area of the promoter region was performed by Sonia Giordano in our laboratory and revealed two dozen of mutations, some of which are novel. We expressed these mutations in several cell lines that typically express CFTR protein using the luciferary reporter system. And we demonstrated that several mutations significantly reduce the expression of the gene in all cell lines, then most likely they are causing disease mutations, while other ones cause a discordant effect in the different cell lines, an increase in some cases and a reduction in others. This would be factors that may modulate gene expression and then they would modulate the clinical expression of the disease at different tissues and organs. Of course, such mutation would act impairing the interaction with regulatory proteins. And now, in collaboration with the group of Piero Pucci, we are trying to reveal by EMS and by Fishing for Partners such novel regulatory factors and characterized by proteomic approaches. For example, this study revealed that within the promoter area of the CFTR gene, there are several responsive elements to butyl rate. And using the model of nasal epithelial cell that we can easily obtain with a non-invasive approach by patients and they, that can be easily cultured, we treated such cell with growing doses of butyl rate that caused an increase an increased gene expression and also some restoring of the channel activity of the CFTR channel. Of course, a series of drugs may be studied with this approach. Now we start the collaboration with an industry which is involved in the production of correctors and potentiators for CFTR mutations. The second area we approached is the area of intronic sequences, 26 introns within the gene that spread about 250 kilobases. It was impossible when we started the study 10 years ago to approach this area by gene sequencing. So in collaboration with the bioinformatic group, Giovanni Paolella and his team, we studied the so-called conserved sequence tags, which are genomic regions of about 100 base pair, highly conserved between humans and mice, because most likely they are the result of a positive evolutionary pressure. They could be a potential resource for the discovery of novel functional elements, and in our case of novel disease-causing mutations. We revealed 52 intronic CST within the CFTR gene. In 22 of them, we uh, found gene variants in CF patients for a total of 42 different mutations, 16 of which were unknown. And this is an example of the effect of such mutation. The first one causes a significantly reduction of gene expression in all cell lines it would act as disease-causing mutation. The other one causes a significant increase of gene expression in all cell lines, thus it could be considered a positive modulator factor. Also in this case, we are trying to define the interactors of these sequences. And the third and last region we approach is the 3' untranslated region of the gene, 
which is the natural target of microRNA inhibition. At that time, uh, a dozen of MIRN were known, were uh, mm, known as potential interactors of uh, the CFTR gene. And for two of them, we demonstrated a significantly inhibition of CFTR expression, the 433 and the 508. This study was performed by Felicia Amato in our laboratory. Well, we analyzed by gene sequencing the target regions of such MIRN in CF patients, and we revealed the mutation that was predicted to significantly increase the affinity for the inhibitory MIRN. We demonstrated that really the mutated sequences was highly inhibited as compared to the wild type sequence, and we described this mechanism as a novel pathogenic mechanism in cystic fibrosis and, of course, also in other genetic diseases. And also in this case, the MIRN region may be the target of a novel therapeutical approach. For example, in collaboration with the group of Gennaro Piccialli of the pharmacy school of our university, we tried to use several PNA peptide nucleic acids to inhibit, to bound the, uh, the TUMIRN and prevent their inhibitory effect on CFTR expression. Here you see the effect on CFTR expression of the MIRN, and here there is the effect which is reverted by growing concentration of PNA. At this point, I have concluded the last 10 years. In the last three or four slides, I want just to tell you what are we doing in the next 10 years of change? One of the topics of our current study is uh, CFTR methylation. You know that uh, about 40% of human genes are predicted to be regulated with such mechanisms, and this is particularly true for genes involved in uh, embryonic development and uh, for a series of genes responsible for human neoplasia. Well, we demonstrated that uh, also the CFTR gene may be inhibited with CFTR methylation. These are the studies, the results in, of different CPG islands in PANC1 cells. But using another uh, cell line, CELA cells, the level of methylation is completely different. So we imagine that this system may be really involved in uh, cystic fibrosis regulation and probably also in the disease. Now, in collaboration with the group of Alessandro Siello, we are studying the CFTR methylation in mice in different tissue and at different age, and our hypothesis is to move to ex vivo cells from CF patients. And finally, silent mutation, which are known, which are predicted to not change the not cause human diseases, but we know that there are several mechanisms in which the silent mutation may cause a disease. For example, the alteration of the splicing, and this was demonstrated for a lot of human disease and also for cystic fibrosis. Several studies by the group of Francisco Baralle demonstrated that the series of, non, of synonymous mutations would alter the splicing and be disease causing in cystic fibrosis. The second mechanism would be the stability of the isoacceptor tRNA or the stability of the messenger RNA, and also this type of effect has been demonstrated, for example, for the COMP gene responsible of individual pain tolerance. But our hypothesis is different. We imagine that different amounts of the isoacceptors would be produced by different organ and tissues. This has been demonstrated in bacteria, in yeast, in plants. Why not in human diseases? This is the study we are performing now to demonstrating this fascinating hypothesis. Let me let me thank all the researchers from uh, my group, in particular uh, Felicia Amato, which is the lab leader now, and of course, let me thank you for your attention.
I had a question about the role, for example, there are a lot of evidence for for scolin and TPA and modulating, natively modulating CFTR. If you looked at the role of how some of these DNA elements may respond in terms of that activity? And this is a very, very important and relevant question. We have no data on this point, but uh, I will use this as a useful suggestion. Thank you. Similar on a similar uh, line. So I guess that in addition to methylation, you see that other epigenetic uh, modifications like histone modifications that uh, could modulate expression of CFTR and may be of interest to see whether there are changes in different, depending on the severity of the disease. Yes, this also is an important question. We have very preliminary data in which we assess the degree of methylation in nasal epithelial cell from patients with different uh, clinical expression. And most probably, this mechanism would contribute to modulate the clinical heterogeneity, but uh, these are really preliminary data. But uh, this is one of our uh, work lines. Of course, also, histonic uh, acetylation is a relevant regulatory mechanism. In other words, for example, the effect of beauty rate that we obtained on gene expression and the restoring of uh, protein activity mm -hmm. is partially due also to the different level of histonic acetylation induced by beauty rate. Mm -hmm. There are no more questions, so the next speaker. Uh, Presentation is by Antonio Simeone, he's the director of the IGB in Naples, and uh, he's going to tell us about the transcription factor regulation in of pluripotency. First of all, let me thank Franco very much because uh, uh, for, uh, for inviting me first to give a talk uh, to this remarkable meeting uh, celebrating uh, 10 years of change, uh, and secondly, because uh, I spent uh, almost six years at the change uh, when I was back from London. I have to thank Franco for giving me this opportunity and uh, a number of uh, interaction with the scientists there. And, uh, in these slides, I represent uh, some of the topics, the project that are uh, uh, that are in pro so essentially in progress from more than 20 years in my lab, particularly those on the top regarding embryogenesis and development of the rostral central nervous system. But today, no. today, ah, okay. Today, I want to concentrate on the most recent of the project that we started, because this was started just at the change about three years ago, and uh, is related to the molecular mechanism that control on the basis of the role of a number of transcription factor, and I will focus on my favorite transcription factor, which is OTX2, in the control of uh, pluripotency, in a, uh, of pluripotency in embryonic stem cells and epiblast stem cells. Naturally occurring pluripotent stem cells are generated only in the embryos, and they can be classified in three types. Those that are called embryonic stem cells, which can be identified in the pre-implantation blastosis uh, by the expression of the transcription factor NANOG here in uh, violet, and uh, epiblast stem cells, which can be identified by the expression in red of OTX2 in the early post-implantation embryos, and the three categories on which I will not give any, any data today, represented by the primordial germ cell. A fourth category of pluripotent 
is, can be induced with the contemporary expression, as most of you know, of uh, four transcription factor, OCT, SOX2, OCT4, SOX2, MIC, and uh, KLF4. And this corresponds to the so-called induced pluripotent stem cells. Well, before to move to the real data, I want, for those that are less familiar for this topic, give some general information regarding primarily embryonic and uh, epiblast stem cells. The first of these represent the ground state of pluripotency and uh, is characterized by specific marker and signals that are required to maintain their undifferentiated states. In particular, this is controlled by the network of the pluripotent mark, uh, factors that I previously mentioned and by the leaf stat tree signaling pathway. For the primate state, which is characteristic of epiblast stem cells, the, 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 the self-renewal and maintenance of their states is guaranteed by a different uh, signaling pathway, which is represented by the FGF signaling pathway. Both cell types can give teratomas, but an embryological, a very important feature rep is represented only, is exhibited only by embryonic stem cells, and this the ability to generate chimeras when injected into blastocyst. In addition, they have specific marker, in particular, FGF5 and brachiuri are absolutely selective marker of the epiblast stem cell. A final information, very important, which a huge number of work has been concentrated because may have a very important reflex in pathological and normal condition, but that apparently seems to be exhibited only by embryonic stem cells is the fact that these cells are not homogeneous, but rather they, are, they can be subdivided in two main subtypes. The one with eye self-renewal, which can be identified by the expression of NANOG in green, and those that are susceptible for differentiation or conversion into epiblast stem cells that are characterized by the presence of OCT and the low or no expression for NANOC. Importantly, the embryonic stem cell state is maintained by a spontaneous fluctuation naturally occurring between this component and the component susceptible to differentiate, which uh, uh, fluctuate normally one into the other, then thus ensuring self-renewal and propension to differentiate. We studied OTX2 because it's expressed at the right place and at the right time. Indeed, it is expressed in the inner cell mass of the late blastocyst in a few cells. That is characteristic for this gene. Why? immediately when the embryo, when the blastocyst implant in the early post-implantation in red is activated very at very high level and remain expressed defining the epiblast. Secondly, in cultured embryonic stem cells, OTX2 is not too ubiquitously expressed but is expressed only in a percentage, about 45% of uh, embryonic stem cells. And interestingly, cells with high level, you can see in this cytospin, uh, uh, cells with high level of OTX2 normally express low or no level, no expression, exhibit no expression for NANOC. 
and similarly, cells with high level of nanoc express low level of OTX2. And finally, and importantly, OTX2 is extremely activation of OTX2 is extremely sensitive to leaf deprivation, decrease of serum, or FGF uh, addition, which is, as I said before, the natural inducer of the conversion of embryonic stem cells into epiblast stem cells. For this reason, we decided to study whether this gene may have a role in defining state and differentiation. In other words, pluripotency of uh, embryonic stem cells and epiblast stem cells in the way that we know, that is to generate mutant. And what we did was first, first, no, sorry, was first to generate uh, embryonic stem cell null for OTX2 or overexpressing constitutively moderate level under the control of the ROSA26 locus. Uh, rapidly going through this data, cells without OTX2 express appear fully pluripotent. They exhibit full staining with alkaline phosphatase and uh, ubiquitous expression of uh, self-renewal naive marker like NANOG and KLF4. On the other hand, cells overexpressing OTX2, even if, in, if cultured in leaf, they are flat, have a moderate, uh, so a, a, a decreased staining for alkaline phosphatase, reduce the number of naive marker like NANOG and KLF4, and importantly, activates the expression and the differentiation of the red cells here of Bracuri gene, which is absolutely specific for the late epiblast state. I forgot uh, to tell you that without OTX2, embryonic stem cells can be maintained in the undifferentiated state, even without leaf and without leaf plus JAK inhibitor. All these data and others that I have no time to show you indicates that OTX2 is an intrinsic factor, play an important role in controlling the balance between the two co basic components of embryonic stem cells, those with high self-renewal and those that are susceptible to differentiation. And our data suggests that OTX2 in synergism with FGF counteract or antagonize the role of NANOG and LIF in promoting the high self-renewal component. And this is the summary of the phenotype of the mutant. Then we studied whether embryon OTX2 is also required in the conversion and in the maintenance of the state of the epiblast stem cell states. And we did the first experiment where we induced through the generation of embryoid bodies grown in serum-free conditions and without inducer like FGF and activin A. And we found that surprisingly, but remarkably to me, Without OTX2, embryonic stem cells are e totally, but totally means totally, impaired in the generation of mesendodermal cells and committed only to a uni uniform fate, which is the neural fate. On the other hand, those overexpressing OTX2 have a prolonged and continued generation of mesendoderm cells at the expense of neural fate. Summarizing in this scheme, without OTX2, the conversion into the epiblast stem cells and without any inducing factor.
factor is impaired and these cells lose pluripotency, being able only to generate neural cells. On the other hand, overexpression of uh, OTX2 promote a higher generation of mesendoderma cells. Then we tested whether the presence of FGF and activin A is sufficient to, 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 to counteract the effect of OTX2 to compensate for the lack of OTX2. And as you can see, epiblast stem cells, pretty normal, not completely normal, are normally induced by FGF and activin A even in the absence of OTX, OTX2. But when we pass these cells to test whether, as expected, the, the, stem, the, 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 the stemness should be maintained indefinitely, these cells exhibit severe abnormality and they fail to maintain the epiblast stem cell state they start to activate alkaline phosphatase and, importantly, lose mesendodermal differentiation and uniformly generate neural cells. This is very indicative, is 2G SOX1 and all colony from normal in a few passages became like this. Thus indicating clearly that TOTIX2 is required not probably just for the induction in the presence of FGF and activin A, but for the maintenance of the epiblast stem cell state. And with the number of experiments, I want to go to make a short, a long number of experiments, we concluded that the missed factor is BMP4, and that FGF, only FGF, activin, and BMP4 can ensure, can compensate not only for induction, but even for a normal, pretty normal maintenance of the epiblast stem cell state and demonstrate all this experiment that OTX2 is also required to cooperate despite what is known in the li literature with BMP4 to antagonize neural fate. OTX2 is required 20 years of literature, say OTX2 for induction. OTX2 is required to provide anterior character to the neuroectoderm. But in vivo is required at early stages to suppress neural fate and promote mesendodermal differentiation. At this point, and finally, this last Cells without OTX2 give teratomas which exhibit malignant features. Probably they are really teratocarcinomas because can be transmitted from a nude mouse to another directly, can be grow and maintain also more than 20 passages, I can say for sure, without leaf and uh, uh, with uh, medium serum. At this point, we decide to go through the mechanism and uh, to identify target for OTX in order to study molecularly the transcriptional network of this gene in embryonic and stem cells. And I show this movie because this is the recognition sequence of OTX2, exactly. And even the title is exciting, uh, at least on our point of view, I translate is Gattaca, the door of the universe. And uh, we perform chip sec experiment, RNA sec experiment. I don't want to go through the RNA sec because uh, the wild type cell were compared with null cells which have a complete different identity. It's too easy to identify gene differentially expressed, but that is not the case for CHIP, because in this case we have the best, the best control for the antibody, that is not IgG, but a cell without the transcription factor. And we identify a number of genes, we classify, and we concentrate 
on these two categories, in particularly on those that are in bold. As you can see, we found that NANOG, OCT4, SOX2, LIN28B, all gene require for pluripotency, but not only for pluripotency, LIN28B is required for processing of LET7 microRNA. All of them are involved in transformation and many other of these other two categories, we concentrate only on BRG1. We decide, a long-term project, we decide to systematically mutagenize the binding site of OTX2 in this target gene to see without touching upstream and downstream protein to see the real consequence due to the abrogation of a single uh, binding site of a transcription factor. And even because I think, and probably some of you can confirm or correct me, in literature it's very clear that transcription factor bind, activate, replace, interact, but nobody did this experiment in vivo before only with transfection. That is to my knowledge, if you know an example, but so far I never found someone suggesting me an example. We identify and reanalyze the, bind the, 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 the binding activity of OTX2, confining our analysis to 10 KB upstream of the start site. These are the, uh, the, the binding uh, the, the binding site for OTX2, for Nano, OCT4, SOX2, LIN28, and BRG1. This is the control in our validation experiments. We generated already all these cells, homozygote mutant for all the binding site of this factor, and mouse mutant carrying the same mutation. Today, I want to show, re very recently, but I want to show one example of this, and this, uh, the cell line where is abrogated the proximal site of OTX2 in the NANOC promoter. Just 120 base pairs upstream the start site and 40 base pair far from the OCT4 SOX2 binding domain required to maintain the circuit of pluripotency. This is the mutant, the mutation that we have inserted. This is a, an additional validation that we did in the heterozygote and is allele specific. One allele is wild type, the other one is mutated. No way for validation. This is the homozygote. Oh, no, again. And uh, when we analyzed cell and compared to OTX2 null cells, we found a completely different phenotype. Essentially, while in the absence of OTX2, we promote high self-renewal, in this case, what we found is uh, not very evident. It's a pretty subtle phenotype, but very important because normally, in uh, wild type cells, the component with I uh, self renewal is about 74% and reflect the number of cells expressing NANOG. And 30%, 35, 40 are those susceptible for differentiation. In this mutant, we invert these two components, as you can see by cell number analysis. It's like that we are changing the identity of the two components, the, the segregation of the two cell type, the two subtype. When we differentiate without any factor, and that is to me surprising, we reproduce exactly the same phenotype we have described in the absence of OTX2. 
Mm? This mutation, these four base pairs in the promoter of the nanog gene are sufficient to abolish the differentiation of mesendodermal cells. And this is, where is the immunostain? Here with T and FOXA2. FOXA2 is an endodermal marker. T is mesodermal. T, as you can see, is not expressed. And all the FOXA2 cells co-express SOX1, indicating that these cells represent ventral part of the neural tube. Then we analyze the epiblast when it's induced with FGF and actin, and we discover that this epiblast, which look morphologically very nice, in, a, in reality lose nanog expression compared to the wild type, lose Bracuri and FOX2, lose e EOMS, which is another mesendodermal marker, and did not express neural marker. In other words, this is something undefined embryologically. In addition, analysis of ERC phosphorylate and BMP indicate that both these two signals are severely impaired, indicating that this mutation and what's happened is a change in the identity, in the physiology of these cells, which is reflected in dramatic abnormalities in the state of the cell. And finally, also this mutation is sufficient to give a transformed phenotype in these cells. We conclude that the loss of the proximal promoter affect the state of embryonic stem cells and uh, impair severely the differentiation into epiblast stem cells and in, in the absence of inducing factors or in presence of this factor. And finally, probably is sufficient to transform these cells in teratocarcinoma, in cells in teratomas with malignant features, which are similar to embryonal carcinoma, which is the natural cancer stem cells of embryonic stem cells and epiblast stem cells. Last, I want to mention Dario Acampora, because most, more than 80% of all this work has been done by him together with other people who have contributed in different aspects. I did also some few experiments. And this start, uh, this project was initiated at the change before the end of 2012 when I was back at home after 14 years. Thank you. Well, yes, yes, the binding is unaffected in the mutant with the proximal site that is mutated. However, just because these are not public, I like to discuss and to say that data even before. We generated also the cell with the three mutation of all the three binding sites. And even more surprisingly, this cell exhibit very, very minor phenotype. So minor that I was convinced that this cell, the one with the dramatic effect, was not due the phenotype that we observed to the mutation, but was something that we selected by chance in the screening. So the phenotype was due to other abnormality. I can be sure now that this is not the case because we have regenerated one year later an independent 
cell line with the same mutation and we get exactly the same phenotype. How to explain the, what you say that is I, honestly is quite difficult. Somebody has muted it systematically. The transcription factor is 95, as you want to do. But individually, yes. <laughs> so I look at the uh, internet and I found a targeted mutagenesis of the endogenous mouse MIS gene promoter, and they mutated SOX9 binding site. Uh, uh, Biomologous recombination. Yes. Okay. So I mean, uh, no, it, no, it seems cool strange to, to me that, that nobody had done somebody it. Somebody did. You are somebody the first to tell okay. me <laughs> this. Recently, there were two aspects. Uh, but systematically, I think it's a, it's a you know, no, big, no, no, big no. endeavor, of course. But individually, I guess. Uh, further elaborate uh, uh, about the new approach for uh, making uh, uh, stem cells just with uh, acidic treatment for very short period of time. Is more epiblastic or uh, pluripotent? It's the so new approach without yeah. the four genes transfected from the same laboratory of the Nobel Prize has been a very short treatment with acidic, uh, um, just the pH, and uh, apparently they get some stem cells from somatic, from many somatic cells. Yes, Do you yes, have any yes. How do you compare? Well, first, I never work on induced pluripotent stem cells or pluripotent cells that can be generated by somatic tissue. I am pretty sure, I would say 99%, that if you check, for example, w for the expression of OTX2 and the uh, relative relation with even mole at molecular, on the molecular point of view with this gene, you will find strong similarity with these cells. And I want also to say in this context an additional point. You probably refer to somatic induced cell in human. These cells have, uh, are much different from induced pluripotent cells in mouse. Those in mouse resemble more to embryonic stem cells, while those in human resemble to mouse epiblast stem cell. One interesting aspect, I know that unfortunately some very important labs are doing, we are trying to do something on this point of view, is to see what's happened if you may induce human stem cells in the absence of OTX2. We did one of these experiments in collaboration with Vania Broccoli for uh, in mouse. But in this case, overexpressing OTX2 and the induced cells, and the we can overexpress because we have the mutant overexpressing conditionally, and the induced cells looks much more similar to epiblast stem cells, like our human stem cells, than embryonic stem cells. Suggesting that probably, so there is something uh, important in making the difference between these two cell type, not only within the same organism, but even between close species like human and mouse. Thank you, Antonio. The last uh, speaker of the, of the session is uh, Carlo Croce from uh, Ohio State University. He will be talking about uh, causes and consequences of microRNA regulation in cancer.
First of all, I want to thank Franco for the kind invitation. It's wonderful to be here in Naples, and uh, the weather now is absolutely magnificent. Now, uh, Tullio Pozzan described uh, a journey that lasted uh, 50 years, uh, and that uh, brought uh, to the characterization of the composition of the Uniporta. Now, I am going to describe a journey that lasted a little bit less. It lasted about uh, 32 years. That brought us to the discovery of a new class of genes which is involved in the pathogenesis of and in the progression of all tumor. This journey started a long time ago when we wanted to figure out whether cancer was in fact a genetic disease. Now everybody knows that cancer is a genetic disease, but 32 years ago, we thought, for the most part, the cancer was induced by viruses. And uh, in order to figure out whether cancer was a genetic disease, we uh, studied a disease called Burkitt lymphoma, where specific chromosomal translocation uh, are present 100% of, of, of this malignancy. And to make a long story short, we found that this disease is the cause by translocation between immunoglobulin loci and the mica oncogene, and this translocation dysregulates the level of expression of the mica oncogene. And since uh, those translocation occur in 100% of the Burke, it was clear that that specific genetic alteration was the initial genetic event that led to the development of Burke lymphoma and indicate that, in fact, cancer is a genetic disease, and in this specific case, is caused by the dysregulation of a specific oncogen. Then we reason that, uh, like in Berkeley lymphoma, the translocation activate MYC, uh, that we should have been able to clone unknown cancer gene by taking advantage of consistent chromosomal alteration. And so we study a disease that is described, uh, the genetic alteration is described here, called follicular lymphoma, which is one of the most common human B cell malignancy, and which is characterized by a 1418 translocation. So, as you know, the 14Q32 uh, is involved in Burkitt lymphoma and the translocation of Burkitt lymphoma, and we uh, thought about cloning the gene responsible for, uh, for, for follicular lymphoma by cloning the breakpoint and identify a gene involved in this translocation. You see the Tsujimoto, a brilliant postdoc in my lab, clone this gene that I call BCL2, and later on I will talk more extensively about th this gene. This uh, gene is involved, as I mentioned, in essentially all follicular lymphoma, and is overexpressed over in uh, uh, all um, follicular lymphoma, and later on was found that this gene inhibit the process uh, of apoptosis, and now is one of the most popular um, genes. After that, uh, we use this approach to clone a number of oncogene and tumor suppressor genes which are involved uh, in the initiation and progression of malignant transformation. Uh, more recently, so we are jumping from, 80, uh, from 1984, 85 to year 2000, we uh, wanted to investigate the molecular genetics of the most common human leukemia, which is uh, chronic lymphocytic leukemia. This disease uh, is a CD5 positive, uh, uh, um, the B cell of this disease are CD5 positive, and this disease occurs in general in individuals over 60 years of age, so is uh, of advanced uh, age um, people. And uh, uh, this disease is also characterized by a specific uh, chromosomal alteration. The disease is also, at presentation, can present itself as an indolent disease. And in fact, most of uh, CLL are indolent to start with, but they can change and they can become aggressive, or they can be aggressive at presentation. These are the, are the four most common alterations in CLL. Um, the most common is uh, a deletion of certain Q14, which is observed by cytogenetics in about 55% of the cases, and is observed only in the indolent CLL, 
or in indolence CLL that became aggressive. The second most common alteration is the deletion of 11Q22, Q23, which is observed in 18% of the patients, and that uh, occurs only in aggressive CLL. The third most common alteration, 12%, is trisomy of tw uh, chromosome 12, and that is observed is either in indolent or aggressive uh, CLL. And finally, the, there is uh, a deletion of chromosome 17P in about 7-8% per of CLL, and all those, uh, and all those CLL are uh, aggressive. And in this region of chromosome uh, 17, we map uh, many years ago the gene for P53. So that uh, loss involved the P53 gene. So uh, we focus on the most common alteration, which is uh, the 13Q14 uh, loss. And we have used an, an approach uh, developed many years ago by Webb Cavani of, uh, called a loss of heterozygosity in order to figure out the region of chromosome 13 that was uh, consistently lost and to narrow that, that region of loss. And after a huge effort, we map uh, this loss to this region of about 700 kilobases. And at that time, there was uh, no um, complete sequence of the human genome, so we sequenced two megabases of DNA with this in the middle, and then we ask a very simple question, is any gene present in this region specifically altered in CLL? We worked on this project about seven years, and we couldn't figure it out. And in fact, my leading postdoc, who was uh, dedicated seven uh, years of uh, her life to try to figure out this gene, um, decided to get an MBA from the Wharton School of, uh, of Business at the University of Pennsylvania and left science altogether. Okay? And no postdoc of mine wanted to touch uh, the CLL project. But I thought that the gene had to be there. So uh, I tried to figure out where the gene was to start with because that will have given me an idea where the gene was. So I went back to my love for chromosomal translocation and I asked my colleague at the CLL Research Consortium whether they have found a CLL with a translocation involving 13Q14. And Michael Kitty of MD Anderson said, yes, two months ago I, I saw a patient with that translocation. So I got the cell and with my own hand, they tell you that once in a while, I still work in the lab, made somatic cell hybrid to immortalize the genome of those leukemic cells. And a brilliant postdoc in, uh, in uh, uh, my lab, uh, George Cullin, mapped precisely the breakpoint at the nucleotide level, and the breakpoint was precisely there, but there was no gene. So it was rather depressing, but what can you do? But finally, and that tells you how luck is important in science, uh, I was talking with the father figure of CLR research, Kanti Rai, and he told me, Carlo, I have a very interesting case of CLL. And I say, why is that interesting? And he told me, because he's in a patient with familiar retinoblastoma. So my ear went up because there are B genes, the retinoblastoma gene is also a 13Q14, but is, uh, is on the left, so he's not involved in, uh, in CLL. But I said, maybe that patient has a large deletion that knock out the retinoblastoma gene and the CLL gene. So let's give a look. So I got the cell, and by my own hand again, I segregated the two chromosome 13, and one of the two chromosome 13 was the key, because it had the deletion of 31.4 kilobase, and you see that uh, the translocation in the other patient occur precisely in the same region. So I thought that the gene had to be here, but there was no gene. Fortunately, once in a while, not very often, but once in a while I read the literature. And, uh, and I started reading about uh, this the new family of genes discovered in East, uh, um, <laughs> in, excuse me, in C. elegans, and uh, the microRNA gene. The first microRNA gene, LIN4, was uh, uh, discovered by Victor Ambrose in 1993. After that, there was totally silence. Nobody was interested in microRNA gene and what they were doing. But in 1998, siRNA were discovered. And since they had the same size, they were uh, small RNA molecule, and they seemed to be working 
uh, similarity to uh, microRNA gene, there was the burst of interest in microRNA gene, it was, and many more were found. In year 2000, it was found that microRNA gene were even in Drosophila. And in year 2001, it was found that they were in mice, rats, and human beings. And we were in 2001. Yeah? So I called George Cullen, and I told him, George, look at whether there are microRNA genes in this uh, uh, region. I still remember his face when he came into my office, grabbed my arm, brought me to his computer, and showed me that, in fact, at breakpoint, there were two microRNA genes that are, in fact, uh, uh, <coughs> encoded uh, uh, these two microRNA RN on the same uh, uh, RNA. Uh, he, he showed me that, in fact, at breakpoint, there were two microRNA, MIR-15 and 16. We look at each other, and we understood immediately that loss of MIR-15 and 16 must be the critical event in the pathogenesis of CLL. So we look at many cases of CLL, we found that MIR-15 and 16 are either uh, uh, knocked down or knock out in between 70 and 80 percent of CLL, and essentially in all the indolent form of CLL, that suggests that this genetic event must be perhaps the first event in the pathogenesis of CLL. That was very interesting because the dogma before was that all the cancer genes, oncogene and tumor suppressor genes, are protein coding genes. And this was uh, the first uh, uh, non coding gene that is involved in cancer pathogenesis. Then we map all the known microRNA gene, and we had another surprise because we found that many microRNA gene map precisely to regions of the genome which are involved in consistent chromosomal alteration, such as uh, the lesion or gene amplification in a variety of human cancer, suggesting that perhaps microRNA genes are involved in the pathogenesis of many human cancer. But I want to show you later on that, in fact, this regulation of microRNA occur in 100% of human cancer and contribute to the pathogenesis of all these tumors. You know what microRNAs do. MicroRNA are regulators of gene expression. And uh, they do that for the most part, not always, but the for, uh, most part, by binding to site the three prime and translated region of messenger RNA and bind to this site by partial complementarity. And when they do that, two things happen, sometimes at the same time, there is a block of translation and some, deg and some degree of degradation of the target RNA. So microRNA can be functioning as suppressor or oncogene, but you should not make the mistake that many people make to call microRNA oncogene or tumor suppressor gene because everything depends on cellular context. It depends on the presence of the target, of course. And even I will show you an example of microRNA that are oncogenic in one cell type and even tumor suppressor in a different cell type. So microRNA can function as a suppressor like MIR-15 and 16 in CLL. I will show you the first mutation that we describe, in fact, in, uh, in microRNA gene in CLL. But some microRNA are amplified at the genetic level. For example, MIR-155 is, uh, is overexpressed in diffuse large B cell, in the ABC type of diffuse large B cell lymphoma. And uh, so this uh, microRNA, so, um, there are data that suggest it is, uh, an on is oncogenic in B cell. And I will show you definitive experiments that show that, in fact, this is oncogenic in B cell. This is a sad story. Because uh, um, before microRNA were, uh, were discovered, we cloned a translocation in an acute lymphoblastic leukemia that involved chromosome 8 and chromosome 17. We cloned a breakpoint. We found that the gene on, seven, on uh, 8 was mixed, and the gene on 17 we called BCL3 that encode a, a transcript that was extremely highly expressed in all hematopoietic lineage. Then we published the paper in PNAS. Then we sequenced uh, this gene, and we found that it did not have an open reading frame. And we dropped the project. That was the precursor for MIR-142, which is the most highly expressed uh, microRNA in all hematopoietic lineage. So in this case, we dropped the ball. 
So at this point, uh, we developed the first microarray to look at global expression of microarray in normal tissue, which is shown here, and in, uh, in malignant tissue. And to, to make a long story short, the expression of microRNA is absolutely tissue specific and cell type specific. You can tell the cell, you can tell the tissue just by looking at microRNA expression. So we look back at CLL. This is a bunch of CLL, about 50 CLL. And you see that there are two groups of CLL, the one on the left and the one on the right. This corresponds to indolent CLL. This corresponds to aggressive CLL. So by using this approach, you can make a correct diagnosis or prognosis of a malignant disease. We have ascended this observation to many more CLL. This is about 94 in a, the, in a paper that we uh, published in New England Journal of Medicine. And to make a long story short, we look at the mutation of microRNA gene and, uh, and uh, in uh, CLL and in normal. In normal, we don't find mutation, but we found mutation that can be either somatic or, uh, <coughs> or germline in a variety of uh, microRNA, although the, re the frequency of mutation was very low. In the, the case of MIR-15 and 16, it was only uh, 2 out of 75. Interesting, in these two patients, the mutation was 7 nucleotide 3 prime of MIR-16-1. Uh, that affects the uh, process of both MIR-15A and MIR-16-1. Um, so, uh, so we found two mutations out of 75 cases. In these two patients, uh, in the blood, we found only the mutant allele that seems strange to us. So we sequenced the MIR-15 and 16 in the buccal mucosa of these two patients. We found that they were heterozygous, indicating that their CLL cell have lost the, mir the normal MIR-15, 16 allele, if, and uh, this in, uh, in agreement with the Knudsen 2 hit hypothesis for chemotopressors, that the normal allele is lost. This mutation affects the processing of MIR-15 and 16, so there is a less mature product. And now it, it then the, uh, the MIT group found that, in fact, this region is critical for the recognition um, by Droja of, uh, of uh, uh, I uh, and therefore is critical for the processing of the microRNA. So this indicates that, that the mutation in uh, microRNA in, in, um, can uh, occur in uh, leukemia, and the loss of uh, a mutation MIR-15 and 16 can cause the disease. Interestingly, one of these two patients, a female, was the daughter of a patient who died of CLL, so was a, ge a, a um, genetic form of CLL, but uh, um, her sister died of uh, breast cancer, and she had the breast cancer. So perhaps, although we don't have proof of that, that the loss uh, of MIR-15 and 16 in the context of this family also led to uh, increase the risk of the development of breast cancer. So this is the position of uh, MIR-15 and 16, and this is the position of uh, the um, of the mutation, seven nucleotide three prime of MIR-16-1. Interestingly, in the mouse, there is one mouse strain that develops CLL late in life, and that is the NZB mouse strain. And uh, so uh, Elizabeth Ravish mapped uh, this mutation in the mouse to mouse chromosome 14 in a region which is homologous to 13Q14. Therefore, she thought it could be MIR-15 and 16. So she sequenced uh, this uh, region in uh, many different mouse strains, and she found that only in the NZB mouse strain, not even in NZW mouse strain, and in, uh, there was uh, a mutation that was uh, uh, not uh, seven, but six nucleotide three prime of MIR-16-1, and that also affects the processing by Droga. So germline mutation in MIR-16 and 15 lead to the development of the indolent form of CLL, both in mouse and human, and more recently, the Lafavra's lab and my lab have done knockout of MIR-15 and 16, and these mice developed the indolent form of the CLL. Then we wanted to figure out uh, what uh, MIR-15 and 16 do. 
So there are algorithms that predict the uh, target. They don't work very well, so though you have to do the experiment to prove that. But I was very impressed by the fact uh, that uh, on the top of the list, there was this gene that we cloned and named in 1984, BCL2. And that made a hell of a lot of sense because there are two major indolent B cell malignancies in humans. One is follicular lymphoma, and the other is CLL. So we thought that could be a, BCL2 could be a target. And this uh, is the work of Amelia Cimino when she was uh, working in my lab. And uh, so we found that there was an inverse correlation between the expression of MIR 15 and 16 and the expression of BCL2. And then we went on to show that in fact BCL2 is the, is the target. So uh, this is a human leukemic cell line with a biallelic deletion of MIR 15 and 16. Doesn't make any MIR 15 and 16 express BCL2. This is a Western for BCL2. We put in a vector, the wild type MIR 15 and 16, and we put in the same vector, the mutant MIR 15 and 16 we got from one of those two patients. And then see what happened when we put in this cell the, this construct, the mutant, there is a knockdown, not tremendous and no consequence. When we put the wild type MIR 15 and 16, there was a beautiful knockdown, degrade activation of APAF1, activation of caspase 9 degradation of PARP, a DNA ladder indicating that if we re express MIR 15 and 16 in a leukemia that depends on that loss, we kill the leukemic cell, suggesting that MIR 15 or 16 could be drug in the treatment of CLL. Yeah? But uh, then we try to figure out whether uh, the, the chromosomal region which are involved in CLL might be talking uh, to each other. I told you about it at the beginning of the different genetic alteration that occur in CLL. I told you that MIR 15 and 16 and 13Q are lost, but then we found that MIR 15 and 16 not only target BCL2, but they also target MCL1, which is uh, another gene of the same anti-apoptotic family. Interestingly, in CLL, both genes are expressed at very high level, okay? So uh, you have a loss of MIR15 and 16, so you have overexpression of BCL2 and MCL1. Then we found that P53 is the positive activator of MIR15 and 16, which are negative regulator of P53. So that might explain why if you treat cell with uh, cytotoxic drugs or radiation, P53 induces cell death, because if you overexpress P53, you will have increase of MIR15 and 16, they will shut down BCL2 and MCL1, and that will cause uh, uh, cell death. I told you that this, the third genetic, the, the second most common alteration of uh, uh, CLL is the, an 11Q23 deletion, and I told you that P53 lost is uh, represent the fourth uh, most common alteration in CLL. But in the P53, which is a 17P, is a positive activator of MIR 34 B and C. So if 17P is lost, MIR 34 B and C are also lost. But MIR 34 B and C are on 11Q23. So if cert is the 11Q23 is lost, these two are lost. Before, the best uh, uh, prognostic indicator for CLL was this protein called ZAP70, and nobody knew why, okay? And uh, ZAP70 is high in aggressive CLL, is low in indolent CLL, and this is the region is why, because if you lose P53, you have aggressive CLL. If you lose the 11Q23, where these two genes are, aggressive CLL, but so when you lose this, ZAP70 is high, so that explains why ZAP70 is a good prognostic, is the uh, um, excellent prognostic indicator for CLL. Now, this I think is a very interesting point. You know that Abbott developed a drug against BCL2. Unfortunately, the previous version of this drug that were developed also killed the platelet, so the side effects were uh, were quite serious. Yeah? 
So they refined uh, this drug, and they got this drug called ABT199, okay? So what is the disease that responds uh, the best uh, to ABT199? Is CLL. Why does it respond so well to MIR one, uh, to uh, ABT199? because it has a very high level of uh, BCL2 expression, but why does it have high level of BCL2 expression? Is because the mirrors are lost, okay? So in fact, I, uh, we predict that we might develop new drug in cancer by looking at the consequence uh, of uh, microRNA dysregulation and targeting the consequence of this, uh, of this change. The, this drug is fantastic. In the case uh, of CLL, most of the patients going to complete remission, you cannot even see minimal residual disease. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit dangerous to treat this patient because they have a, a lot of cancer cell. There is a huge tumor lysis in a few hours or a few days, so you have to keep this patient hospitalized when you do the treatment. But so this indicates that uh, we can take advantage of this dysregulation for the, for the identification of drug that might be uh, uh, working well in a variety of cancer. Uh, cancer. So some microRNA work as suppressor, some work as uh, oncogene in some specific type of cell. So now we wanted to prove that uh, we can cause cancer just by dysregulating a specific microRNA. I told you that MIR-155 is uh, overexpressed uh, in a BT, a, a, the ABC type of diffuse B cell lymphoma, so we try to dysregulate MIR-155 in B cell of the mouse. So we made a construct in which we dysregulate MIR-155 B cell by using the immune enhancer of immunoglobulin. We got a lot of transgenic mice, and the transgenic mice express huge amount of MIR-155. Now these are two mice, three months old. One is wild type and one is transgenic. Do you see any difference? The transgenic mouse looks fatter, yeah? but it's not fat, it has a huge spleen. Yeah? And in fact, you look at the histology of this spleen, A, B, C are the histology of three spleen of three mice, two, three, four months old. The structure of the spleen had been destroyed by leukemic cell. Yeah. This mice three months old, two, three, and four months old. This is a bone marrow of the uh, wild type three months old mouse. This is a bone marrow of three months old transgenic mouse, and this cell has been positive for um, TI67. So this, all these mice, the penetrance is 100%, are dead, all are dead by six months. Okay? So it's as powerful as milk in the induction of, uh, of lymphomas and uh, acute lymphoblastic leukemia. So, uh, so in, in this case, the dysregulation of a single microRNA lead to cancer. It takes short time. So it's possible that during that short time, additional genetic or epigenetic changes contribute to malignant transformation. But the driver in this case is MIR-155. So these are the culprits, they are large pre B cell. This is just to show you that uh, the same microRNA can be an oncogene in one cell type and a stimulus suppressor in another cell type. Just look at this, excuse me. Look at this, two to one, two to two. Two to one, two to two are lost, as we have shown some time ago, in erythroblastic leukemia. You put them back, the cell are killed. The critical gene is KIT, which is a powerful oncogene. So these two target the KIT, they are lost, KIT is high, and they drive, drive the cell for leukemia. But in hepatocellular carcinoma, the microRNA that are dysregulated the most are MIR-221, 222, okay? And uh, uh, overexpression of this microRNA shut down four major tumor suppressor genes at the same time. P27, P57, P10, and TIM3. Now, in collaboration with uh, Massimo Negrini at the University of Ferrara, we made transgenic that dysregulate, uh, that have uh, a dysregulation of two to one 
in their liver, and these mice develop uh, hepatocellular carcinoma. So again, in that case, you dysregulate a single microRNA, and these mice develop cancer. So I want to make just two points in the next uh, 60 seconds. At this point, uh, we wanted to figure out whether the same microRNA might be uh, involved in different human tumors. So we established the profile in uh, of microRNA dysregulation in different solid tumors which are described here. And then we ask the question, are the same microRNA in dysregulated in several of these uh, uh, tumors? And the answer is yes. For example, look at MIR-21. It's upregulated in six out of six solid malignancy. And now we know it's upregulated in 16 out of 16 different solid malignancy. And so, what does it mean? It means a very simple thing. That these microRNA are downstream target of pathway which are commonly involved in cancer pathogenesis. And uh, more recently, if you look at the last issue of cancer cell, you will see we have looked at different and many different uh, colorectal cancer, both in mouse and in human, and we found that one microRNA, uh, MIR-135B, is upregulated by the pathway which are involved, in fact, uh, in the pathogenesis of colorectal cancer. Now, microRNA can also affect genes involved in repair, so they can cause, uh, uh, they, um, uh, when they are dysregulated, they can increase the mutation rate, so not only they can shut off tumor suppressor, but increase mutation rate and, co and contribute to cancer predation. This is my last slide. We found that microRNA, which are regulator gene expression, have also a different function. Yeah. Cancer cells secrete very large quantity of microvesicle and exosome. And uh, so this is the lung cancer cell secreting a lot of microRNA, a lot of microvesicle that contain microRNA. This, mi this microvesicle fuse with cells in the microenvironment, particularly macrophages. MicroRNA are, uh, macrophages are great fusers. And they deliver their cargo. And uh, their cargo of microRNA find its way to endosome through very well-known pathway bring this microRNA to the endosome, and in the endosome, some microRNA, not all, some microRNA, in particular MIR-21, bind the toll-like receptor eight in human and seven in the mouse, which is its homolog, and induce an F-kappa B and secretion of tumor necrosis factor alpha interleukin-6, and that increase the metastatic potential of, uh, of the cancer cell. So microRNA are not only regulator gene expression, but they are also hormones. Okay? More recently, I don't have time to show you the data. The paper has been published about a couple of weeks ago. We found uh, that cachexia, which is the wasting syndrome, which is associated with some of the most aggressive and uh, uh, bad cancer, like pancreatic cancer and lung cancer, is caused precisely by this mechanism. So pancreatic cancer and lung cancer secrete microvesicle and a lot of microvesicle. The microvesicle go, get into the blum, uh, bloodstream, fuse with muscle. You know, muscle cells are, are professional fusers, fuse with the myoblast and kill them. Yeah? So uh, cachexia is caused by this mechanism and possibly other systemic effects uh, of cancer could be due to this mechanism. So in summary, the discovery of microRNA involvement in cancer provides us with greatest op great opportunity for a better cancer diagnosis and prognosis and for detection of uh, by known, uh, by known uh, in invasive uh, means of uh, uh, cancer and possibly will provide new opportunity for cancer therapy. Thank you very much. A bit over time, but maybe if there is one quick question, and maybe left the other ones for this. Yeah. Carlo, you showed the last uh, example of a microRNA which is uh, inducing uh, 
uh, so you said a sort of hormone which is inducing uh, uh, um, the NF kappa B pathway. Mm -hmm. However, uh, uh, is there any evidence since uh, tumors are inducing uh, usually a, a, a an immunosuppressive uh, tumor microenvironment? Uh, mm -hmm. Are there examples of microRNA which can be immunosuppressive? Oh, it could be. It could be. Like, the, it's possible that there are microRNA that instead of uh, being agonists uh, of toll-like receptor, are inhibitor of toll-like receptor. Okay? We don't know. But anyway, we found uh, that uh, a, a, the microvesicles secreted by tumor uh, fuse with uh, many different cells in the body, in particular macrophage and dendritic cell, and uh, muscle cell and possibly other cell. And uh, the microRNA get into the endosome and bind the toll-like receptor. Then the response to that can be different. In, uh, in, in fact, it's different in macrophages and uh, in myoblasts. And the, uh, in, for example, in myoblasts, uh, the, the activation of, of toll-like receptor causes death. It doesn't... Uh, cause secretion of, inter of uh, uh, interleukin-6 and tumor necrosis factor. So you showed the example that uh, microRNA can act as hormone by traveling from uh, one tissue to another, yes. one cell to another. Uh, and this is also has been observed not only in cancer, of course, but now the, the alternative um, mechanism, well, it's not an alternative, an additional mechanism is also the fact that uh, microRNA by being uh, put in vesicles and secreted are depleted from the original cells. And so it can, they can cause uh, gene expression abnormality by just being depleted from the, from the cells. Yeah. Uh, I know that uh, some people also... Uh, yeah, but that would be depleted in the cancer cells. In the cancer cells, okay. yeah. Okay. It might contribute uh, more to the cancer phenotype, I don't know. I forgot to tell you a very important thing, uh, which indicates that this mechanism is really what right. uh, was going on. And that is, uh, this mechanism depends on the expression of toll-like receptor, eight in human and seven in the mouse. If we do this experiment in a toll-like receptor seven negative mouse, right. there is nothing. Okay, so it depends on the sure, expression sure. of the like receptor. Hmm. Okay. Start with I think again we don't have any coffee break. However, there is a self-service system outside at the coffee point, if you wish. So we proceed with the next session. Okay, can we continue? What? No. Okay. We have five more speakers for the very last session of uh, the day and the next speaker is uh, Jacopo Meldolesi that will tell us about the rest transcription factor and neurosecretion. Okay, first of all, I wish to thank again uh, and <coughs> Franco and all his colleagues for the invitation. And uh, I've been, uh, many years ago, I've been the director of the San Rafael in Milan of research in San Rafaele, and I know how difficult it is to do 
uh, something like this, and I suspect it's probably uh, probably more difficult to do it in Naples, and uh, therefore I'm really uh, very very much uh, impressed by uh, what has been done here. Um, this story that I want to tell you will uh, summarize uh, uh, what has been done in my laboratory uh, during the last uh, 15 years or so. And um, this is um, a story that is a little bit different uh, from our normal uh, pr previous story because I'm a cell biologist, a traditional cell biologist in order, uh, because it deals uh, with uh, uh, a transcription factor or a transcription repressor, which is uh, more easy done, which is called REST, or NRSF, if you like more, which binds to uh, the DNA, to a, a DNA binding domain with the, this eight zinc, eight zinc fingers. And uh, um, the binding domain is uh, long, it's about 23 residues. And uh, as you see here, it does uh, permit the, the functioning of uh, two uh, uh, repression domains, uh, and uh, this uh, uh, permits uh, the repression of a number of genes, which have been calculated to be several thousands. So uh, in, uh, it's probably one of the most important uh, uh, repressor existing in the cell. Um, indeed, what happens uh, during development is that in the stem cells, uh, there is a, a lot of, of rest, uh, which then during development in the progenitors of neural cells, at a certain point does decrease because the, uh, the mm, repression of, the, uh, of rest increases tremendously. And then neural cells are very, very low and hardly uh, appreciable uh, level of rest. And uh, therefore, they do express many of the genes that are repressed by, by REST. So what happened to us, and the reason why we got started with this uh, new type of experiment, is the fact that we were working things long in this type of cell, which are called PC12, which come from the fear chromocytoma. And uh, as you see, they do have a lot of secretory vesicles. And at a certain point, we isolated a clone, which was coming exactly from the same type of cell, which, however, had no uh, such uh, dense core vesicles you see here. And uh, investigated a little bit, they were totally unable to do neurosecretion, although they were neurosecretory cells. And uh, this was interesting for us. And uh, therefore, we did. Uh, go along, and after a few years of work, uh, we uh, demonstrated that indeed, the wild type PC12 had so little rest that it's uh, hard to, to show it, whereas in the uh, clones that we had isolated that were downregulated or were not expressing the, uh, the dense core vesicles and uh, neurosecretion in general, the level of rest was very high, both at the, at the level of messenger and at the level of the protein. And for this reason, we thought it was an interesting story because we had been in, in interested in neurosecution since uh, uh, tens of years, and therefore we could uh, say something more about this. And indeed, we took some uh, uh, normal the uh, wild type PC12, which contain uh, the dense core vesicles, as you see here, and we transfected some uh, of, the, of the rest. And as you see here, the vesicles become much smaller, and the, although they still contain the uh, neurosecretory protein, as is shown here by the mono cell chemistry, but the, the level becomes small, and if we increase the uh, expression of rest in these cells, they disappear completely. And vice versa, we took the cells that were uh, missing the dense core vesicles and we 
uh, decrease the level of rest. In this particular case, uh, as you see here, the dense core vesicles reappear, and not only they do reappear, but after stimulation with ionomycin, as visible here, they are discharged. So new secretion is totally reappeared uh, in these cells or, or re-established in these cells throughout the process. So the first conclusion is that rest governs expression of new secretion. And now, after so many years of work, I can say that almost all the genes that are connected with neurosecretion, which are uh, mm, about 100, uh, except three are uh, repressed by uh, high, um, by high, um, but uh, by high rest. Uh, sorry. And uh, mm, okay. Um, the same approach that you have seen so far can be fruitful in the study of a variety of other problems. And so um, we have studied many such problems, but I'll show you something more. Uh, a question was, uh, a few PC12 clones are incompetent for neurosecretion. I've shown you that they were totally incompetent. Does this mean that they do not possess any regulated exocytosis? And the answer is no, because we did experiments in, uh, in, um, in um, electrophysiology with, uh, in collaboration with a group of CHI in Japan. And what we uh, observed by measuring the capacitance is that in normal PC12, you do have a dual response due to the, uh, to the, uh, written, to the early vesicles or small vesicles and the, uh, the dense core vesicles I've shown you before. So this is a large vesicle or dense core vesicle, and this is the small vesicles or clear vesicles. In our <coughs> defective cells, what you see, that there was indeed an increase in capacitance. So in other words, there was an addition of membrane to the plasma membrane of the cell, uh, as it happens with exocytosis, which was approximately of the same size of what you see here. But this was not due to these vesicles because they were not existing. And uh, for years we have been looking at the existence of these vesicles. Indeed, I had been interested since uh, at least 15 years on the fact that uh, exocytosis is not a property of secretion. So in other words, there are many other organelles within the cells that are discharged by exocytosis. And this in particular, is a, an organelle we have finally uh, uh, discovered. These vesicles are present. Each cell contains something like 20,000 such vesicles. And uh, when you stimulate, they, they do fuse with the plasma membrane. These are not stimulated, and uh, they are labeled by immunoperoxidase, as you see here. And uh, they are discharged by exocytosis. And this uh, uh, is not... Uh, uh, is uh, responsible for the result I shown you early on. So the second conclusion is that uh, the vesicles that I've shown you that we have called enlargosomes, uh, because they do provoke an enlarge of the plasma membrane, apparently without uh, inducing any other function in the cells, uh, they, they do exist uh, in these cells. They have an exocytosis different from that of the uh, uh, secretory vesicles I've shown you before, because you might know that in that particular case, the, uh, the snare that exists in the vesicle is uh, called VAMP2. In this particular case, is uh, VAMP4 and uh, other um, snares that work are SNAP23 and Syntaxin6. And this type of activity is not important only for uh, our uh, joke with, uh, that I've shown you before, but it is important also um, uh, for uh, the shedding of vesicles that has been uh, discussed this morning. Wound healing, uh, uh, I think uh, Andrea spoke about uh, wound healing, and uh, in addition to his lysosomes, also these vesicles are able to do wound healing when the cell needs more 
sur surface membrane in order not to, to die and to, to have the healing of its uh, wounds uh, for cell shape uh, changes, for cytokinesis. Uh, actually, in all cases in which you need more surface, you do have the discharge of this type of, the, of vesicles, including macrophinocytosis and urethral growth that I will consider a little bit later. Uh, sorry. Now, uh, I'm not sure I've convinced you that indeed uh, this, uh, uh, this um, story is interesting and that enlarger sums are important for these uh, functions, but there is another story that I want to summarize very briefly. And this uh, concerns the differentiation of PC12. PC12 cells are very popular uh, on the market uh, in neuroscience simply because uh, you do, um, uh, you have, uh, because they are the model, the most uh, um, used model of uh, differentiation of neural cells. There are about 15,000 papers about PC12 cells. So uh, if you take our cells that have high rest, I'm sorry, that have high rest, uh, essentially they do not respond to the application of NGF with uh, the outgrowth of uh, neurites as it occurs with the other PC12 cells. And, uh, uh, sorry, and the reason uh, was not really understood, but we had thought, together with many other people, that indeed this was due to the fact that they did not express the receptor for NGF, uh, the uh, tyrosine kinase receptor with NGF, uh, which is called track A. But indeed, when we measured track A, finally, after a lot of efforts, we found that the level was absolutely normal. Whereas the receptor that was missing, uh, I'm sorry, the receptor that was missing was the other receptor of uh, uh, NGF, and indeed, not only of NGF, but of all uh, neurotrophins existing in the cell, which is called uh, P75-KDA. P75, NTR, here, uh, P75, NTR, is a receptor that was considered to be to only to increase the affinity of uh, P75, of um, track A. But indeed, we demonstrate here that in, without uh, P75 and TR, there is no response uh, in the terms of outgrowth and of other responses typical of the, um, of the NGF. And uh, this is demonstrated by the fact that reestablishing P75, as we have done here, we uh, reobtain, uh, for example, here, the phos phosphorylation of uh, track A, which does occur under those conditions and which is blocked in our cells, although track A is present, and the uh, outgrowth on neurites that I've shown you before. Okay, so far for this, now we want to, to move to pathology as requested, and the pathology has two aspects here. Where one aspect uh, concerns uh, uh, the tumors, uh, is REST an oncogene or a tumor suppressor? You see, in general, what, ha what happens if you, if you look uh, at uh, many uh, transcription factors which are uh, oncogenes or tumor suppressor, they are either one. There are a few that are uh, both, but in general, the story is not that very uh, simple to, to explain. In this particular case, the story is very simple because in the cells that are non-neural, in which the level of rest is high, uh, if you uh, decrease rest, uh, you have a proliferation. So in other words, uh, uh, rest works as a suppressor. Whereas in neural cells, which have low level of rest uh, physiologically, if you increase the level of rest, you do have proliferation. Uh, in other words, it is a, an oncogene. So we investigated this uh, story in, uh, in our cells, 
the, the one uh, you have seen uh, before. And uh, what we found was the fact that uh, the cells, our cells, had a low level of TSC2. TSC2 is a controller of mTORC1, as it is shown here. And so we thought, okay, everything is clear now. There is more proliferation because there is more activation of mTORC1. But this was found not to be the case because indeed TSC2 also controls the, uh, the um, metabolism of beta-catenin. As you see here, beta-catenin uh, can be destroyed uh, in the uh, proteasome uh, when it is phosphorylated by GSK3 beta. TSC uh, uh, increases the activity of uh, GSK3 beta and therefore keeps the level of beta catenin low. If uh, in this case TSC2 is decreased by rest as it is, you, you do have uh, uh, at the end uh, more beta catenin because uh, uh, TSC2 is inhibited and that does not uh, modulate positively uh, just uh, K3 beta, you have more beta catenin and therefore beta catenin can go to the nucleus and make uh, its uh, uh, job. And indeed, this uh, shows that this is, is the case. You see that beta catenin uh, in the nucleus is much more in the cells that have high rest is much more respect to the condition in which the rest is low, so the wild type is it well. And this increases the proliferation, as you see here, which can be blocked for, uh, pharmacologically by, uh, um, by uh, inhibiting the uh, movement of uh, beta-catenin to the nucleus in this particular case, uh, or blocking its uh, metabolism in the other case. Um, so we can uh, conclude our story about tumors, uh, which is if rest is low, as it happens in uh, uh, neural cells, you see uh, low rest, uh, so uh, TSC2 is, uh, uh, is uh, low, so is high, so beta-catenin is inhibited, and what uh, we do have is neurosecretion, which is uh, stimulated, which is not inhibited by rest. Okay, so we have a lot of neurosecretion and very little proliferation under those conditions. In however, if rest is high, we are speaking about uh, neural cells, so they do they have to proliferate. When if rest is high, uh, neurosecretion is low, as you see, you have seen here. Uh, previously, uh, TSC2 is low, so beta catenin is high, gets to the nucleus and activates proliferation. Finally, uh, role of rest in uh, brain diseases. So the second type of diseases I want to uh, mention is uh, the diseases of the, of the brain. And if you look at the literature, rest is involved in several diseases of the brain. Some genetic diseases such as the Red Syndrome, uh, this form of epilepsy, the Huntington disease, which has been investigated by Elena Cattaneo, our scientist uh, plus uh, senator that all of us know now. Mm, uh, I know her since uh, the time she was a student. No. Uh, and in addition also in psychiatric diseases such as autism and schizophrenia. So it may be important, but uh, the, uh, the, the, what has been uh, proposed is also that rest kills neurons. So there are data in the literature that demonstrate that a high, very high rest, by the way, kills neurons. So uh, it has been proposed that rest is a neurotoxin factor. So the literature is a little bit uh, uh, confused in this because uh, various laboratories, including ours, have found uh, something else. Uh, for example, that it, it protects from uh, uh, seizure progression. So in, in other words, some epilepsy 
it does protect from uh, uh, Parkinson's disease uh, induced by this drug. And uh, then uh, during, uh, the, in the human brain, uh, rest increases progressively during, during aging. So in my age, for example, I suspect in my neurons, uh, rest is increased. And the increase is not that small uh, based on the data of these uh, people uh, that I published in, in, the, in Nature very recently. Uh, it's uh, about uh, from five to tenfold the, the one normal. But the interesting thing is that in, uh, in other neurodegenerative, in patients of Alzheimer and other neurodegenerative uh, diseases, this increase does not occur. And apparently this has an important role in the development uh, of the disease because uh, it does increase the uh, toxicity of neurons, the fact that rest does not increase as it happens to the people that survive. In the meantime, or actually early on compared to, to them, we had already uh, demonstrated uh, together with uh, um, um, uh, together with our colleagues from Genova, that uh, during long-term uh, stimulation, the, the rest levels increase, and this in increase is in uh, increases intrinsic homeostasis and protects neuronal networks. This is the point. It does protect neuronal networks. Now I'll show you uh, one uh, result in this. Uh, you see what happens. Uh, the cells are stimulated by 4-AP, which is a drug for aminopyridine, which does stimulate uh, the, um, the cells because it, it interferes with uh, the uh, potassium channel. And as you see, the uh, rest under these conditions at the level of the messenger and at the level of the protein does increase considerably. And this is accompanied by a decrease of the sodium channel, of the sodium voltage gated channel. So in other words, what happens in, under these conditions, if you have an hyperstimulation, uh, you do decrease your excitability of the cell. Okay, the cell becomes less excitable. And this protects the cells, as is shown here uh, by the fact that they don't die at all under those conditions. Whereas if you use glutamate to stimulate, you kill about half of the cells. So uh, you, you can see this here, these are dead and these are uh, totally unmodified uh, uh, in terms of, vis of viability. So this is a very important story. We do have in our brain a mechanism that protects our uh, neuron, neuronal cells from hyperstimulation. Of course, you could say, I don't get uh, for aminopyridine every day, but, and this is true, but you can consider about people having uh, epilepsy, which means uh, a stimulation under those conditions. They, they could uh, be uh, uh, protected by this type of mechanism. And so the final conclusion is that uh, uh, rest, widely considered as a master factor of neural cell differentiation, governs expression of a large number of genes different from cell to cell and in single cells in various functional states. So this is very important. Uh, depending on the functional state, you do have uh, I'm through. Huh? And uh, second, rest plays a key role in pathology, in particular in various tumors, I'm sorry, in various tumors, uh, oncogene tumor suppressor and in the brain where it operates as a neuron protector. Thank you very much for your patience. So very, very, very fascinating, this story. So just uh, I'm wondering whether um, if exist mutation in rust in human that are associated with the specific uh, acceleration 
for example, in uh, aging brain or in disease, for example, AD or PD, something that makes sense with your basic studies. Thanks. Now, there are mutations. Uh, um, however, the, the animals die. And so I suspect that there are mutations also in men, but they don't, uh, they don't uh, survive. Uh, the, um, they die during uh, pregnancy and, and so on. Uh, one thing I, I didn't say is that the data of the other people, those published in Nature, are, uh, have been obtained in the animal, but in a, in also in, in cells, in uh, growing cells, but in addition also in the brain of um, man. And uh, so the data, um, since there is a good correlation, appear to be quite strong, also from the human point of view. So let me uh, starting with uh, by uh, I want to thank uh, Professor Salvador and Professor uh, Cimino for the invitation and also for the organization of this uh, exciting uh, meeting. I think all of us uh, are enjoying. And just a second, uh, also to thank uh, Professor Salvatore for. Uh, his uh, very hard work and a lot of things uh, he did uh, during the last uh, 10 years to let uh, change uh, to exist uh, and uh, to grow. This uh, gave us, uh, gave the possibility of many of us and uh, especially to many young scientists to uh, do uh, their work. So, thank you very much. Um, as you can see, my talk will focus on some aspects of uh, uh, differentiation. Just to introduce the, the point, um, you know that all the story starts with the uh, one single cell, the zygote, through billions of uh, uh, mitosis, myriads of uh, cells are formed with uh, very different uh, functions. This means that uh, in a relatively short time frame, uh, many, many differentiation events uh, take place, thus generating a complex and coordinated array of functions. And differentiation continues to function also in the adult uh, to replace uh, the cells and uh, to uh, commit some cells to uh, specific uh, uh, functions. Um, as you know, oh, oh, all the story starts with the, this cell uh, which undergoes mitosis, thus uh, becoming two cells, and uh, these cells divide and so on, and uh, at this time of the development, all the cells seem to be identical, but something is happening. The first differentiation event, that is the formation of the trophoblast cells and of the inner cell mass. Uh, at the molecular level, this uh, uh, event is uh, already uh, detectable uh, before 
the formation of the early blastocyst. In the next uh, 24 hours, a second differentiation event takes place. That is the differentiation of the cells of the inner cell mass into two uh, different populations, the epiblast cells and the hypoblast. During the last uh, years, we tried to uh, find and to study uh, some molecular determinants of these two first uh, differentiation events of uh, all uh, um, complex organisms uh, by using uh, different uh, approaches. And uh, I, I will uh, uh, tell you about a couple of examples. The, the, the molecule we found that uh, acts most precociously uh, in the uh, development is the transcription factor uh, KLF5. Uh, we first demonstrated that this transcription factor is one of the molecules necessary to maintain the pluripotency of uh, um, mouse embryonic stem cells and that the constitutive expression of uh, KLF5 uh, maintains the pluripotency even in the absence of LIF. You know, LIF is uh, a factor which is uh, uh, absolutely necessary to maintain, to sustain the pluripotency and the growth of uh, mouse uh, embryonic stem cells in vitro. As you can see, KLF5 is actually expressed everywhere in the uh, mature blastocyst. Uh, it is expressed in the hypoblast or the precursors of the hypoblast marked by GAT4. It is expressed in the uh, trophoblast uh, marked by CDX2. And it is also expressed in the uh, ep epiblast uh, inner cell mass uh, marked by OCT4 and NANOG and uh, in these cells it is expressed at uh, lower levels compared to uh, the other two compartments. Uh, and uh, the expression of KLF5 uh, declines very soon after the induction of uh, the differentiation of uh, uh, ESL in vitro, as you can see, actually uh, it disappears uh, a few days after the induction of the differentiation, but also in vivo uh, uh, at uh, 6.5 uh, the days, uh, the, uh, the, this transcription factor is actually undetectable. It will uh, reappear in the adult in some uh, specific uh, uh, districts, but uh, we can say that uh, it is actually very specific of the early stages of uh, uh, the uh, development. And we realized that uh, um, KLF5 is expressed very pre precociously. As you can see, it is expressed in the morula uh, and uh, it is expressed in all the cells uh, during the first differentiation event. This is a very early blastocyst and as you can see, KLF5 is expressed everywhere, although uh, again uh, in the inner cell mass, it is expressed at lower level compared to uh, the precursors of the uh, trophoblast cells. Uh, to try to understand the, the role of this molecule in uh, these uh, first differentiation events, uh, we uh, tried to study the phenotype of uh, uh, embryos uh, in which KLF5 is uh, deleted. And uh, the phenotype of uh, 
the, the KLF5 knockout is uh, dramatic. This is a wild type uh, early blastocyst. Uh, as you can see, the uh, cavity is already formed uh, and uh, OCT4 and KLF5 uh, are expressed. The KLF5 knockout uh, embryo is uh, completely different. The cells continue to uh, grow, but no cavity is formed. Uh, and uh, uh, the cells uh, uh, do not differentiate in the sense that there is no segregation of the cells expressing the markers of uh, the first uh, differentiation events. So we can say that no blastocyst is, uh, uh, is appearing. The reason why for this uh, very early and dramatic phenotype is uh, uh, not easy to understand. Uh, but uh, considering that uh, uh, KLF5 is a transcription factor, we start to look at uh, the genes targets of uh, uh, KLF5 just to understand um, something more uh, about uh, its function in uh, these specific uh, uh, cells by uh, CHIP-SIC. Uh, and we found something that could be uh, a starting point to understand this phenotype. Um, just to introduce very briefly the molecular mechanism of uh, these first uh, differentiation events, uh, what we know about the molecular mechanism of this event uh, it actually consists in the uh, segregation of the expression uh, of uh, some uh, transcription factors like uh, uh, GATA3 and uh, CDX, uh, CDX2 in the cells of the surface of the morula and uh, in the expression of uh, OCT4, NANOG, SOX2, and other pluripotency markers uh, in the cells present within the, the embryo. And the reason why for this segregation uh, was found in the HIPPO pathway. In fact, uh, as you can see, uh, TED4 controls the transcription of both GATA3 and uh, uh, CDX2 uh, together with uh, uh, its cofactor YAP and as you know YAP is present in the nucleus when it's dephosphorylated while it is present in the cytoplasm when uh, it is phosphorylated downstream the uh, hip pathway and uh, in this elegant paper it was demonstrated that uh, YAP is present in the nucleus of the cells uh, uh, on the surface of the morula and of course uh, all, uh, in the cells of the trophoblasts or trophoblast precursors while it is present at low levels in the cells within the morula uh, uh, which are committed to became um, the, the cells of the inner cell mass. So the apparently uh, trivial explanation for this uh, first uh, differentiation events is that the cells of the surface have an apical membrane, while the cells within the embryo uh, contact other cells uh, on every side, uh, so the hippo pathway is activated, the app is phosphorylated, is restricted in the cytoplasm, and so uh, CDX2 and, uh, uh, and uh, GATA3 are uh, turned off. Uh, and uh, going back to KLF5, 
we uh, uh, explored this, uh, the data of the systematic analysis of the KLF5 binding sites, and we found that uh, uh, GATA3, very importantly, uh, TED4, IAP2, and also LATS, uh, are possible targets of uh, uh, KLF5. And uh, one possibility is that the uh, different levels of KLF5 in the cells uh, uh, of the precursors of the trophoblast and in the cells precursors of the inner, uh, inner cell mass could contribute to the uh, function of the machinery um, that is upstream the expression of, of GATA4. Consider that uh, GATA4 is not dispensable for the establishment of the trophoblast line while uh, CDX2 is a very good marker but uh, in the absence of CDX2 the trophoblast is uh, uh, actually normally uh, formed. Uh, let's go to the, to the second differentiation events that takes place uh, during uh, uh, development. Uh, the, the second differentiation event is just this. The cells of the inner cell mass differentiate into epiblast and into hyperblast. Just a few words to uh, say what they are. The, the, the epiblast uh, are the precursors of, of all the uh, cells of the, uh, of the adult. And hyperblast uh, are very important to uh, give some uh, signals to these cells. For example, to establish the uh, anteroposterior axis of the embryo. In fact, in the uh, epiblast, there are these cells, the so-called uh, uh, anterior uh, visceral uh, endoderm, which uh, secrete molecules like DKK, LFT1, LFT2, which are antagonists of uh, uh, well-known morphogens like uh, Wnt3, uh, nodal, and so on. So, for example, the presence of lefty secreted by the anterior uh, visceral endoderm means that uh, nodal works here but not here, so this uh, uh, will become the anterior uh, side of the embryo and this will be the posterior side of the embryo. In uh, uh, this uh, complex machinery, the cytokines of the TGF beta family play a very important roles, in particular BMP4 nodal activin. And uh, uh, BMP4 and nodal uh, uh, already function in the previous stages, just in the moment when the uh, inner cell mass uh, differentiate into epiblast and uh, hyperblast. As you can see very schematically, this phenomenon can uh, be studied also in vitro by using uh, ES cells. Uh, mouse ES cells differentiate into epiblast stem cells and BMP4 blocks this differentiation, while nodal uh, sustains the phenotype of uh, the uh, epiblast stem cells. Uh, while working on uh, uh, the regulation of this transition, we uh, discovered the new molecules, we named uh, uh, DS1, not DICE, DS1, uh, and we uh, demonstrated that this is a co-receptor of the uh, BMP4 um, uh, receptor and uh, has uh, 
an important role in the regulation of the BMP4 signaling. Uh, Antonio Simeone, Simeone already um, introduced you the, the experimental approach to study the differentiation of embryonic stem cells in vitro. One of these approaches is that of the serum-free embryo bodies or uh, SFEBs. As you can see, a few days after the induction of the differentiation, uh, uh, most of the cells express uh, SOX1, that is a marker of uh, uh, the neural precursors. So this means that uh, ES cells uh, um, uh, differentiated. If we um, suppress uh, DS1 by an interfering, interfering um, uh, the, it is evident that the differentiation of uh, uh, ES cells towards uh, uh, narrow ectodermal cells is uh, hampered. Uh, in fact, the number of the uh, cells expressing the pluripotency markers like nano, goct, and so on is absolutely increased. Compare these few groups of cells present within uh, the uh, body in uh, normal uh, conditions. We demonstrated that uh, these are epiblast stem cells by using uh, specific uh, uh, markers. Uh, and uh, the, the reason why for this phenotype actually is that uh, uh, the suppression of the S1 hampers the signaling by BMP4. So uh, the block of the differentiation um, by BMP4 is removed. The cells uh, differentiate into heavy blast cell stem cells. And at the same time, there is an increased signaling by nodal. And this maintains the uh, phenotype of the epiblast stem cells, preventing their further uh, differentiation. This is the basis uh, for a uh, physiologic uh, regulatory mechanism based on uh, a microRNA, the microRNA 125. Uh, we studied the uh, behavior of uh, uh, microRNA during uh, these two first differentiation uh, uh, steps, and we realized that uh, there are many changes in the uh, concentration of these uh, uh, molecules. There are uh, microRNAs that are decreased. Uh, very pre precociously, a as you can see, the uh, blue bars refers to uh, two days uh, uh, after the induction of differentiation. And there are also many microRNAs that are induced, th that accumulates soon after the induction of the differentiation. And these changes are significant. Consider that uh, this scale is a log scale, so the, the changes are, uh, uh, in some cases, very um, significant. We, <coughs> we uh, identified several uh, uh, direct targets of these microRNAs involved in the uh, differentiation events I mentioned, uh, and we studied the uh, regulatory mechanism uh, underlying uh, uh, this uh, uh, interaction. Uh, one of these uh, uh, microRNA uh, is linked to the story of DS1 and uh, uh, BMP4. In fact, we observed that the uh, microRNA 125B uh, is uh, uh, targeting DS1 in uh, uh, embryonic stem cells. 
as you can see, the overexpression of the um, precursor of uh, this uh, microRNA results in a phenotype actually identical to that induced by the silencing of uh, DS1. And uh, uh, this phenotype is completely uh, rescued by the contemporary expression of uh, uh, DS1 liking the 3' prime uh, UTR. So, uh, um, we can say that the, uh, the, the amount of the microRNA 125 in ESS is regulating the signaling by uh, BMP4. When we look at that, the regulation of the, uh, of the um, generation of this uh, uh, microRNA, we observe that it is regulated by BMP4 itself. As you can see, the precursor of the microRNA and the measure form uh, accumulates uh, as a consequence of the exposure of the cells to BMP4. Uh, the, the, this mirror is decreased when uh, the uh, signaling is blocked by the silencing of uh, uh, one of the uh, components of the BMP4 receptor. And uh, uh, SMAD1, that is one of the transcription factors downstream uh, of BMP4, is recruited uh, at the uh, promoter of the uh, uh, 125 uh, 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 gene. Uh, so actually, uh, this uh, uh, means that uh, this is a very uh, scholastic uh, um, uh, feedback loop. The BMP4 activate the transcription of the uh, microRNA gene. The microRNA targets DS1, the core receptor of uh, uh, the BMP4 receptor, and uh, this uh, um, hampers, uh, downregulates the uh, transduction of uh, the signal. Thus, this uh, machinery actually maintains uh, the sensitivity of uh, the ES cells to the BMP4 and uh, prevents the uh, differentiation of the cells into the epiblast stem cell. The question is uh, uh, that uh, this equilibrium must be broken to go ahead to, to allow the cells to uh, differentiate into uh, epiblast stem cell. Uh, one possibility is that uh, uh, the microRNA uh, 125B is uh, the reason why for the uh, turning off of this uh, uh, feedback loop. In fact, uh, it is uh, actually identical to uh, the um, 125A, of course, targets uh, DS1, and uh, is one that accumulates soon after the induction of the uh, differentiation. Uh, we don't know the mechanism that regulates this uh, uh, accumulation, but we know for sure that uh, uh, the transcription of uh, the gene of this microRNA is not regulated by BMP4. So it is possible that uh, this question mark means the trigger that allowed the differentiation. I have finished, I want just to uh, thank in particular uh, Silvia Parisi, uh, uh, he 
his uh, brightness, his energy, actually is the basis of most of the results uh, I showed you. Uh, and uh, I want also to mention the students uh, who leave the laboratory but gave important contribution to uh, the things I showed you, Ligia Loy and Carolina Tarantino. Now they are in uh, Barcelona. Marika Battista is in Milan. And Fabiana Passero uh, is a, a very promising uh, researcher of uh, the University of Naples. Thank you very much. of your slide where you show over expression of mirror 125 I saw that the mirror 200 family members were very low do you see Zeb 1 and Zeb 2 over expression no you know I don't we don't uh, see I don't know if uh, there is the case mm. we don't uh, uh, see that uh, we selected the, the we selected the, the um, microRNAs that are present in the S cells and are increased, and not those that are completely absent and appear. Also because in, 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 in this case, the uh, extent of the change is biased by the fact that uh, in uh, the normal cell it is completely absent. And another point is that we uh, selected also on the basis of the presence of these microRNAs in uh, differenti already differentiated cells. We are interested in the molecules that are changing just during the first event and maximum the second events and not in neurons perhaps on So next speaker is Keiko Ramirez from Mount Sinai School of Medicine and he will talk about is tissue biology ready for prime time, is it? I don't know. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, the time is late and we, are, and we are tired and I will be fast, brief, and I will be seated. So um, you heard throughout the day a various aspect of cell biology and their relevance to diseases. And uh, in my presentation, uh, as the title implies, I'm going to take a, a different dimension, still relevant to diseases, but rather than telling you a story, I will just give you a review, a brief review of the evidence. And there, as I said, and their therapeutic application. First and foremost, what is tissue biology? And to answer this question, I went to uh, what is considered the encyclopedia of humankind, of human knowledge, which is Wikipedia. And in Wikipedia, the definition is that the tissue is an ensemble of similar cells from the same origin, then together carry out a specific function. That definition is wrong. And I think that is enough that we take some genetic example to make that case. And let me tell you about one that I'm familiar with. This is a disease, very rare. It's a group of disorder called epidermolysis bullosa. And as you can see, it's a genetic a pathological continuum of, uh, that affects skin. But uh, at the uh, molecular level, it affects a different uh, aspect of the cell component, i.e. the cytoskeleton, the cell surface, integrin, receptor, and the extracellular matrix, protein that connect. And that is the, the issue that I want to emphasize, that the cells actually work by connecting with the outside, with their microenvironment. And that is, in this case, a physical connection that you can see better represented by this EM, in which you can sh see 
This is a high resolution uh, uh, EM in which you can appreciate the complexity both internal on the cell size and external on the extracellular matrix side. But if I were to take out those uh, uh, connotation, you will be unable to distinguish which one is the cell side and which one is the outside. And essentially, the point is the tissue is an architectural and bioengineering between the cell and the microenvironment. And this bioengineering starts early in development. You've seen this a couple of times today. If we take uh, a just fertilized eggs, the ratio between cells and the extracellular matrix is A to 2. So that is mostly cells, but as you become an adult, that ratio changes, <laughs> which reminds me that I have to thank Frank Adult. <laughs> Was I respectful? <laughs> it's 20% and 80%. So if you take this view, which is an extreme view, what this embryo does is essentially makes matrix. And what we do as an adult is to repair matrix. And as you, we, we become old, we deal with losing matrix. So while we are concentrating on the cell as the engine of tissue function, that is incorrect. Tissue function is the reciprocal and dynamic relationship between cell and microenvironment and extracellular matrix. And so let me go to the conclusion so I can see it. Uh, the conclusion is if I look from the cells and I don't just uh, draw the cells like was drawn in the Alberts, which is suspended in space, but I put in the context of what is around that that cell made sweating and blood <laughs> to get through embryogenesis, the relationship is quite complex. It is a relationship of structural support. You know that cells require matrix to adhere proliferate, differentiate, and even undergo apoptosis. The other function is a function of force transmitting network. We know that cells respond to the environment, to the bigger environment, by uh, sensing mechano uh, signals and activating mechano uh, signaling and mechano transduction, biochemical response that they are transmitted from the extracellular matrix and they are translated into biochemical signals. The extracellular matrix also provides another thing. It provides instructive uh, uh, information to cells. Those can be structural via integrin through the RGD sequence, but they also are deposit uh, um, of uh, growth factors. We all know that TGF-beta, BMP, FGF, uh, and, and a number of growth factors are kept into the matrix and utilized in due time through the release from the matrix. And all these three things must have something to do with the so-called cell niche, with stemness. And I will get to that at the end. But let me start with the growth factors that they are it's an interesting issue and has been known for quite some time. So for example, one of the first evidence uh, was by Napoleone Ferrara many years ago with regard to uh, VEGF. Like many of the, of the growth factors, they are sequestered into the matrix because they stick to a very sticky component of the matrix, a very boring component of the matrix. There is no glycobiologist here, is it? No, proteoglycans. And proteoglycans are sort of softening out the matrix all over. They don't have really a structural specificity. VGF comes in two forms by alternative splicing. One form is a soluble VGF, and the other one is one that binds to the matrix. And genetically, it has been proven that these two forms of the same growth factor have totally different function and signal through totally different ways. The first one, um, in, 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 uh, regulates vascular dilation and hyperplasia, and the matrix bound instead vascular sprouting. The first one has a short-lived uh, receptor phosphorylation, the other one has a prolonged-lived phosphorylation. 
So the matrix is, uti is utilized by the cells to communicate across the matrix to other cells different messages using the same molecule. That is even more dramatic if you look at TGF beta, which is where I was going to go. So TGF beta is secreted as a latent protein. The latency is acquired via two interactions. One with the propeptide, which is cleaved but not removed, and the second one by association with a family of protein that is called APTRI, latent TGF beta binding protein. So that's, that is called the large latent complex, which is secreted into the matrix, where is attached to the extracellular matrix component via interaction with fibronectin, collagen, and fibrinins. So those are structural molecules. Those are molecules that make tridimensional structure that give physical properties specific for different tissue. They're not like proteoglycans. And then the signaling by TGF beta requires two steps, the liberation from the matrix and the liberation from the propeptide. So release and activation. And that occurs via integrin, matrix metalloproteinase during tissue remodeling, and extreme pH. Now, let me show you two situations in which uh, the interaction with the deactivator, the integrin, or the interaction with the uh, um, sequester, if you will, the fibrillin, leads to changes in normal tissue homeostasis. So, I can skip to this. Um, the activation via integrin is because it's mediated through a bond between the integrin, the cytoskeleton on one side, and the integrin and the large latent complex on the other side. Remember, the large latent complex is stuck to the matrix. So what it follows is depending on the, uh, whether the matrix is pliable or, st or stiff, there is a different force traction, and therefore the opening of the complex and the release of the TGF beta. Now, that occurs, it's part of a disease process, which is the counterpart of a physiological process that has to do, as I've been mentioned, in wound healing. Wound healing is a process whereby epithelial cells receive a per an, an insult, activates, a number of different cells to become myofibroblasts. The myofibroblasts start to deposit a matrix. The matrix then can either go through a cycle of restoration of structure, or if the insult is persistent, it goes through a cycle, which is a fibrotic cycle, that ends with organ failure. And this is the most common tissue degeneration that occurred because any kind of disease, including cancer, has a fibrotic component. Now, if you look at this from the perspective of the matrix, the, uh, this process, the, uh, the position of a matrix with uh, uh, tightly cross-linked collagen, has two effects. First, what has been called a durotaxis. That is, cells will get stuck on a matrix that is stiffer than normal. And the second one, because the matrix is stiffer, an improper activation of TGF beta, which is sequestered into the matrix. So because of this, uh, recently has been published a paper by the group of uh, um, um, uh, Henderson uh, in, uh, in California, in which they've shown a proof of concept that by targeting the alpha V integrin, which is the integrin involved in the activation of TGF beta using small molecule, in mice in which they had induced all different form, form of fibrosis, renal fibrosis, pulmonary fibrosis, or, kidney, or, or um, liver fibrosis, they could ameliorate the progress of the disease, and in some cases, in the liver case, they can prevent the disease. 
So even though it's downstream from the insult, it has a, such a, a prominent uh, uh, um, contribution to the progress of disease that you can intervene at that level. So that is a point that relates to the activation of the TGF beta that is sequestered into the matrix. Now, what happens when it is improperly sequestered in the, into the matrix? And in this case, I will talk about the molecule that interacts with the latent TGF beta um, complex, which is fibrillin. Now, fibrillin is a molecule that is involved is the cause of Marfan syndrome, which is a common sort of common uh, uh, connective tissue disease. And in this disease, one of the manifestation is dissecting aortic aneurysm. But if you look at the aorta of mice that uh, mimic the disease, you see that uh, the structure, the morphology of the aorta is normal at birth. It just becomes further and further deteriorated with time in a manner that looks like a maladaptive tissue remodeling. And when you look at the level of TGF beta, the level of TGF beta in the wall of the aorta of this mice is improperly elevated. That means that in this case, there was an, an opportunity to target a downstream effect of the loss of this, uh, of the genetic loss of this protein by uh, uh, intervening on the TGF beta, since we cannot change the uh, fibrillin, um, restore fibrillin uh, expression. How this was done, this is work of Haldiz. Because the proof of concept wanted to be applied in the, clinic, in the clinics as soon as possible, the thought was to target a regulator that is upstream of TGF beta in the vessel and one of these regulators is the angiotensin-angiotensin receptor system, which is involved in multiple uh, physiological and pathological uh, processes, including uh, regulating TGF production during fibrosis. The reason that this uh, uh, system was taken is because there is a bunch of drugs that are available and FDA approved, FDA approved such as the sartans. So this, the, the, the preclinical trial was very simple. Take losartan, uh, uh, administer losartan to mice vis-a-vis -vis of uh, using a different anti-hypertensive drug just to separate blood pressure uh, effects from TGF beta effect and show that if you treat this mice with the losartan, the dilation is prevented. So that provided proof of principle. A, uh, clinical studies uh, started in humans five years ago, and we have now the first data showing that have appeared uh, in the European Heart Journal that losartan has a beneficial effect on patients with the Marfan syndrome in that it uh, de delays significantly the formation of the uh, uh, dilation. So this it's another example of how the interaction between the matrix and the uh, cells can be used to um, deal with the pathological condition that have to do with tissue degeneration. This is a typical example of tissue degeneration. Now, we have talked about stem cells. And there was a pretty experiment done by Danny Disher several years ago in which he showed that if he takes uh, human stem cells, embryonic stem cells, and you put them in culture. He's a, a, a biomechanics, a bioengineer. If he puts it in culture without any growth factors, without any cell, but just changes the, the, uh, the stiffness of the extracellular matrix, he gets the stem cells to differentiate according to the natural uh, stiffness of the tissue they belong to. So if you look at this uh, uh, over here, you can see that we go from uh, um, one kilopascal to 100 kilopascal in different cells from bone to muscle, soft tissue versus hard tissue. And this was done 
the uh, differentiation is the result for the differentiation are this uh, uh, microarray uh, data that show expression of, pro of uh, genes that are peculiar of one cell, li cell lineage versus another. That is sort of also, there are two corollaries to this. Number one, if you put cell in plastic, no matter what, they freak out. So if you want to do a, a over a transcription analysis of these cells, you're not really looking at the real situation. And number two, if you think about using stem cells for bioengineering for, to repair defects, like in this case, the mandible, if you provide an artificial substrate or a scaffold, which is already the adult scaffold, you're not going to get the right differentiation. Because it's with time that the cells provide for themselves the information outside which in turn feeds back to them. So is, um, is the extracellular matrix involved in this or is just a, a, a biomechanic? Is it just a passive role or is it an active role? To address this is that issue, people have looked at the bone because bone has, it's a, an easy sort of easy uh, uh, tissue to work with, plus goes through a constant remodeling, which utilizes two types of cells, the osteoclast, which destroy the bone, and the osteoblast, which put bone back. When osteoclast uh, uh, destroy the bone, they release BMP at TGF beta. And TGF beta has been shown genetically to be important for the recruitment of uh, stem cells that go through the osteogenic uh, pathway and then put back the bone. So there is a, a cycle. So the question was, I've shown you that fibrillin is important for maintaining normal modulation of TGF beta. Do we have any evidence that uh, in the absence of fibrillin, this system is altered? And so, we looked at mice with Marfan syndrome and found that these mice are osteopenic. They have gradual bone loss. And this gradual bone loss is associated with a transient uh, uh, decline, first an increase and then a transient decline in bone formation and a constant uh, activation, abnormal activation of bone resorption. So, Osteoclast is always more active than normal, and osteoblast start to uh, bone formation starts to be higher than normal and then goes rapidly down. That mimics uh, age-dependent osteoporosis. And if you look at the, all the cell markers doing cell culture experiment and all the other stuff, you notice that A, osteoblastogenesis is activated there is an increased number in osteoclast, and there is a decreased number in adipocytes. Now, for anybody who, has, who knows about osteopenia, you know that but when you lose bone, you acquire more fat. These mice have less bone and less fat. So that points to a defect upstream of osteoblast, a defect someplace where uh, osteoblastogenesis, osteoclastogenesis, and adipogenesis converge. So we go to the niche. And the niche and the definition of the niche, that was the previous slide, the definition of this niche was always based on a concept which came from Drosophila and C. elegans, which is an environment of the cells in which cell-cell interaction allows maintenance of stemness, which is self-renewal, and then differentiation. One problem with these two wonderful genetic system, model system, is that they don't have an extracellular matrix, essentially. As we go to uh, a more uh, uh, evolved uh, uh, eukaryotes, such as vertebrates and so on, like in the case of, of the bone, we know that the niche is much more complex. And in the bone, is even more complex than other uh, tissue because the bone marrow is the site not only of mesenchymal stem cells, but also of hemopoietic stem cells. And the two niche talk to each other, right? So what happened in these mice when we looked 
at all the markers of differentiation. I show you only this one of osteoblastogenesis because they are the easiest one to show. So we are looking at, at, at the following time course, one month, three months, and six months. Let me translate in human terms what does it mean. Between one month, at one, between one month and three months, there is maximal acquisition of bone mass. So in essence, there is end of puberty. Uh, uh, at, at achievement of sexual maturity between three months and six months is a huddle to when remodeling kicks in. And then after three months is old age and so on and so forth. And we are looking at mesenchymal stem cells. Definition is weak because we don't have as many markers in mice that we have in humans. Progenitor cells, those are the clonal uh, cells, the one when you put in culture, they maintain uh, adherence uh, and, and stay there. Osteoblasts, obviously, those are the, the differentiated osteoblasts, and osteocytes. And this is an interesting cell because it's the cell that is embedded in the bone, communicates via canalicula, and is the cell that you make during the first months of life and stays with you until death. And that cell communicates, and by communicate, and communicate in senses mechanoloading. You know that if you don't have mechanoloading, you lose bone. And the osteocytes, this is the one that communicates. If you look at the, uh, the number, they are pretty much normal at one month. At three months, there is a diminution of mesenchymal stem cells, an increase in progenitor, an increase in osteoblasts, and increase in osteocytes. By six months, everything is down except obviously osteocytes because they last forever. It sounds like a song. Uh, so if you put this in a scheme, essentially what you see is an accelerated deprivation of the mesenchymal stem cells pool. So the loss of fibrillin changes the self-renewal of the uh, status of the mesenchymal stem cells, adult uh, mesenchymal stem cells, push them to osteoblastogenesis, I, I don't show you the, the, the uh, data, to the detriment of adipogenesis, and ends up the eliminating the pool of uh, 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 progenitor and stem cells earlier than expected. Now, if you take these cells and in vitro measure TGF beta activity using a reporter cell line, so you're looking at activity, not production of TGF beta, you find that these cells have more active TGF beta. They don't have more TGF beta, they have more active TGF beta. So there is an, a, a problem with the modulation of the growth factor. Following that, what happens if we systemically inhibit the TGF beta rather than going through the losartan? Doesn't work anyway. If we do a systemic inhibition of TGF beta in this mice, we restore normal bone mass, but most importantly, we normalize the number of mesenchymal stem cells. So we rescue the phenotype, essentially. So that tells us that, to the best of our knowledge, this is the first structural molecule outside the cell that regulates the activity of the cell niche. We believe that the regulation has to do with the modulation of TGF-beta, either by presentation or by proper uh, distribution within the matrix. And through that, uh, through a number of other steps, regulates osteoclastogenesis via the hematoriatic stem cells. The mice have problem also with the uh, blood cells. And uh, uh, through uh, the blockage and through the regulation of adipogenesis. Now, you can imagine different way to do things, but is attractive the thought that if you have to define a niche, you don't have to change the composition of the matrix. The cell can make that matrix different by decorating that matrix with growth factor in a different way. And that is an attractive uh, way to avoid to have to specialize every single piece of tissue to get uh, different functions. Now, want to conclude, I promise you that I was going to be short. Uh, the tissue biology, the interaction between the cell and the matrix, so I hope I convince you, works at, at several different levels. At the molecular level, by regulating cell behavior. 
at the macromolecular level by regulating growth factor by availability, and at the mechanical, uh, at the tissue level by regulating mechanical and structural property. What is important is that all of this function may be altered during uh, uh, tissue degeneration, and because it's not just a structural function, this offers probable target for therapy in this condition. Thank you. You've shown that uh, <clears throat> to obtain uh, the inactivation of DGF beta, um, you uh, block angiotensin too. So there is a cascade of events blocking this. There is no side effect uh, in, in this case. You don't think that uh, since there are many molecules that act as a, an activator of TGF beta, it's better to act on this molecule. As for instance, we have done blocking transglutaminase activity and obtaining obtaining improvement in, uh, in, uh, in liver fibrosis? So f first of all, we are blocking AT1 receptor activity. What you do with re blocking AT1 receptor activity, I, don't I didn't have the time to go through. You block two things. You block TGF beta upstream without interfering with many molecules that are important for other tissues. That is the problem with the res rescue of the osteoporosis. We are not doing so well when you look at the side effect of that but tells you that at least you can go for a molecule that is on the TGF beta pathway specific for that tissue. And the second thing is that the AT1 receptor is also a mechanosensor. When you lose fibrillin and when you lose the um, uh, mechanical property of the, of, this, of, the, of the tissue, what you get is a double effect, an increase in TGF beta because of the function of regulating TGF beta, but also a decrease in mechanical uh, property and therefore increase in mechanosignal, abnormal mechanosignal. So the losartan works there because we are eliminating both of those two. As a matter of fact, if you try others, it doesn't work that well. It doesn't improve, but doesn't block. Maybe the, the solution is to look at the target you want to obtain. Sure, no, no, the target, uh, but okay. The next speaker is Alessandro Ziello of Change, and he will speak about D aspartate from bacterial cell wall to schizophrenia. First of all, uh, grazie Franco, grazie for uh, these very good days, and uh, thank you as well because you gave me seven years ago the opportunity to start with my experience as a PI at Change. So uh, the topic, sorry, jump, no, so, okay. So the topic of my presentation focus on the functional characterization of a molecule that in the past uh, was believed to belong selectively in the bacterial physiology. Indeed, as all the amino acids in the past, uh, these molecules were believed to just uh, be implicated in the processes that were typical of prokaryotes. But later on, with the advance of more, more sophisticated technologies able to uh, ameliorate uh, an anti separation between amino acids, has been possible to observe that this molecule, this atypical amino acid, occurred not only in invertebrates, in invertebrates, but surprisingly also in human, in the brain human. Among the amino acid existing in the brain human, for sure the serine is the most well established. The serine acts as an endogenous molecule able to stimulate a class of glutamatergic receptors that play a crucial role in cognition. And in several physiological processes, ranging from cell migration, synaptic plasticity, and many others. So,
for this pharmacological feature, the serenit has been also used, at least in the last 10 years, also in clinics, where it is used against some aspect, some specific features related to schizophrenia, what we call in negative symptoms and cognitive deficits. So, on the other hand, the role of the other D amino acids that occur quite abundantly in the mammalian in the mammalian brain, the aspartate, actually the focus of our work, as I said, much less is known. The only relevant observation is peculiar distribution that we can observe in this very simple cartoon. The aspartate is highly enriched in the developing brain to then later decrease dramatically in the postnatal life, this due to the concomitant expression of its catabolic enzyme named DDO, the aspartate oxidase. In line, current with this oversimplistic graphic, we can observe an image related with an immunostaining with the aspartate. And as we can see here, the aspartate is largely abundant at birth to then decrease consistently and to reach low level at three weeks postnatally, when, in this case, rats across the winning phase. So what we show here for rats is the same in humans. Indeed, when we wear embryo, in our embryo cortex, the amount of this amino acid even exceed the level of the L form. The L form implicated with protein synthesis. Why? Which is the role of this embryo enriched molecule? This is an issue that in the next future with uh, Tommaso Russo, we try, and uh, Silvia Parisi, we try to answer. But go on in the story. Among the different brain areas, what take our attention is the hippocampus. Hippocampus display, as we can see, the highest the aspartate oxidase activation activity. So it suggests that there's some reason nature has created the enzyme so highly enriched in this brain area, suggests that in this area, a stringent control over this substrate must occur. Moreover, the aspartate, similar to the serine, has been shown to bind, to bind an MD receptor, an MD receptor that are largely expressed in the hippocampus. And considering that hippocampus represent a core, several areas where converge mechanism underlying cognition and spatial memory, overall these considerations are consistent with this uh, hypothesis that this brain area represent probably an ideal region where to verify the existence of a known function of this amino acid. So first example, first experiment, we start just analyzing the pharmacological effects of the aspartate application on a simple brain slice of wild type animals. And what we can see here, it's a very relevant data. So it means that the aspartate application in the CA1 area of the hippocampus trigger the inward currents that were in those dependent manner, as we can see here, antagonized by a competitive enemy antagonist, suggesting that the aspartate not only binds enemy receptor, as demonstrated by Matus Fag 20 years ago, but this uh, the amino acid is able to activate and to produce inward currents through this class of glutamatergic receptor. This is the first proof, and for us, was very important because give us two important 
information. One, the target, enemy receptor. The second, the sites of action, because this effect that we report in the competitive manner, it means that the aspartate is acting on the glutamate sites of activation of this receptor. So, actually, this experiment is simple, but open all the next experiments. So, based on this, it's obvious that by generating mice, this is work entirely done, thought, and performed by Enrico, it's uh, our leader in the lab. So basically, this experiment, after the first characterization on brain lice, it's uh, almost, of course, it's uh, expected. So generation of mutant mice by removing uh, DDO give rise and increase in the diaspartate level in the hippocampus, almost 50 to 18 fold increase. Based on the previous observation, it's not surprising that such increased level of the aspartate modulate a form of synaptic plasticity at CA1 synapses, known as LTP, producing a stable level in mutants compared the early decay of this form of synaptic plasticity observed in wild type. And considering that LTP is believed to play as the neurobiological substrate for memory formation, it is nice the fact that this mutant display at the four months of age an improvement of their cognitive abilities. So it's simple, but Gene targeting, it's amazing. It's true, it's a very powerful technique. Gene targeting is very robust way to identify and decipher new function for genes that for many reasons are difficult to be characterized. But for behaviors, gene targeting may have some limitation. Limitation because Homologous recombination may produce different phenotypes in relation to the genetic background of the strain where it happened. And therefore, in order to confirm what would be observed in the mutants, we develop with the Francesco Napolitano, the other important researcher, my, the second angel in the lab, we develop a new strategy to high enrich the level of the aspartate in the adult brain by simply administering in the tap water, like vitamins, like orange juice, the aspartate. And we do that for one month, two months, 12 months, or intermittently, just in relation to the question that we want to answer. In the first, we show, and this is very important because in the first experiment, we showed that three months over administration of the aspartate dramatically increased the LTP, the same LTP that was increased in mutants, but was just, just slightly increased, suggesting that some adaptation, some molecular changes related to the gene target itself may reduce or attenuate the phenotypes that we can observe directly and strongly, just administering the aspartate for a short time in, three, in adult mice. Again, according to this announcement of the LTP, we observe an improvement in the spatial memory of these mice. And now, based on this observation, we wonder to another question. Everybody knows that female gender is more vulnerable to the aging decay, especially in the specific form of cognition. Human and mice, females, show a more consistent decrease in their spatial memory abilities during late phase of their life and in the human during menopause. So this means that the drop of estrogen 
by downregulating the functionality of NMD receptor, affect negatively the function of the hippocampus itself. And therefore, we wondered, but if we administered the aspartate, we increase synaptic plasticity, we increase memory. So why not try to challenge the same with all the females? And we do that. We administered the short, just a short time, just four weeks, four weeks in animals of one year old. It's nothing but the effect of one month's oral administration that again results in a twice level of the aspartate in the hippocampus has a dramatic effect. This is the LTP in old female untreated. This is the level of the LTP in females with one, over one month of treatment. And what is surprising that the LTP measured in animals, female, with over one year is even improved when compared to female with the just two months. We are, taking, we, are, we are saying that the molecule treated for just four weeks is able to restore synaptic deterioration in females of one year old, and the level of this announcement in synaptic plasticity exceeds the level of female of simple two months. So this is strategic, and this is a, may have translational application. So, a question. But this effect is stable, or is it reversible? So to answer this question, again, we use this strategy. And in this case, we treat animals in an intermittent way. We administered the aspartate. The aspartate for three months let increase the, the level for twice. At this concentration correspond an announcement of the LTP. Then uh, we interrupt the treatment for three weeks, uh, largely enough to normalize the embryo, the hippocampus level of this the amino acid. And uh, corresponding to such interruption for three weeks, we normalize again the LTP. Again, LTP is our without uh, to monitoring the functionality of an MD receptor, the functionality of this important receptor. And uh, what is more surprising, like, uh, a, a switch lighter, we can, after such interruption, treat again animal with the one month and again reactivate an enhanced level of an MEDA. So we are using in tap water a molecule that can induce an up, down, up regulation of an MEDA receptor. So many of you, maybe, working in other field, do not have clear the important role, the important and crucial role of an MEDA, but in few minutes, uh, you well understand what is the point. At this, at, this, at this moment, what we can say that the aspartic acid enhance NMEDA transmission. But uh, NMEDA transmission, when DAO regulated, produce uh, effects uh, that are, you can see the effect in zebrafish, you can see the effect in humans. So NMDA transmission is crucial to be healthy subject because the regulation of NMDA transmission lead to severe alteration at uh, sensory motor gating level, at cognitive level, that antagonist for NMDA receptor like ketamine, like fenciclidine, like the zilocidokine, produce symptoms that are indistinguishable to those, to those experienced by schizophrenic patients. So in other words, we have an hypothesis called the hypoglutamatergic hypothesis of schizophrenia that point out the fundamental importance of a functional NMDA activity. So we have a model. We have a model to test and challenge the hypothesis where if enhanced NMDA transmission can counteract the psychotic-like symptoms induced by dissociative and hallucinogenic drugs. And this is the first experiment. We treated the animal with the fenciclidine, what is known in American as angel dust. Fenciclidine produced 
dissociation, hallucination, produce dramatic effects. And what we see by an fMRI experiment performing collaboration with a friend in Genova, what we see that administration of fenchilidin in a wild type induce a dramatic dysregulation of cortical, limbic, and thalamic regions. This hyperactivation may underpinning what we call in humans as hallucination. But interestingly, lack of DDO enhanced of the aspartate level dramatically prevent this dysregulation. And uh, in line and uh, currently with this difference in uh, imaging observation, we observe that administration of fenchiclidine produces a lower stimulant response in mutant mice. And also, we observe in collaboration with Andrea de Bartolomeis uh, different uh, gene expression pattern induced by fenchiglidine between wild type and mutant. So we are saying that in uh, presence of high abundant diaspartic level, an anti, an, a, a compound known to produce schizotypic effects is quite protective. And finally, we move to another test. This test is called prepulse inhibition on the starter reflex. This test is important because it's the only test in behaviors that is conserved across the mouse to humans. So by using this test, in mouse we can detect the schizotypic effect of, the, of compounds, and in human we can, I say, verify the levels of the severity of schizophrenic-like symptoms. And what we see is that uh, in knockout DDO mutants or in animal treated just with two months, uh, the dissociative effect of amphetamine and the zidizilipine compare what appear in the wild type is consistently reduced. But schizophrenia, sensory motor getting alteration are not a domain restrict to prefrontal cortex or hippocampus. Basically, this alteration occur because alteration occur in another brain region named striatum. This region, striatum, belong to the basal ganglia, and this region is involved in the control and in the negative modulation of insults, in sensorial insults. And what we observe that similarly to what show in hippocampus, administration uh, of uh, the aspartic acid produced in dose-dependent manner the inward currents that were antagonized again by enemy the antagonist. But the most uh, curious, provocating, fascinating observation is that uh, the regulation of the aspartate produces synaptic alteration, in this case we know as in long-term depression inhibition, that are the same found after chronic alloperidol administration. So we are saying that the most widely antipsychotic drugs used each day by million persons over the world, producing a brain of mice, a modification, an estriatal, an estriatal adaptation, named as a long-term depression inhibition that is completely undistinguishable to that one produced by the aspartate case it itself. So it's not the mechanism, but it's a very intriguing correlation. But at this point, we move from mice and we go to humans. And what we observe crossing the bridge from mouse to human is to analyze the brain level in schizophrenia patients in prefrontal cortex, and we observe that, uh, and this is a clear significant effect, that uh, in schizophrenia pre pre patients, the aspartic level, it's almost the 50% compared the level of controls. But this, as this uh, difference is selective on the amino acid uh, concentration, because uh, the L levels between control and schizophrenia were completely undistinguishable. And to explain uh, this neurochemical difference, uh, we 
further analyze the DDO expression and we observe that the decrease in the aspartic level in schizophrenia were paralleled by increased DDO mRNA expression in the, st in the same brain area analyzed of patients. But we are so far in the phenomenological in the phenomenologic description. Nice, but it's descriptive. So, jump inside the brain. So, get inside. What happens? What is producing the aspartic acid in the brain? We are just saying that it's protective. It's, we say that it's increasing LTP. Uh, it improves memory. But which is the biological substrate? Which are the building uh, the building element that make difference between a brain with increased level of the aspartic acid versus a control brain. And to do that, we analyze the effect again of just one month oral administration and we observe that this short supplementation induce an increase in the metabolic activity of different brain ear that encompassed hippocampus, limbic area, and the prefrontal cortex. So we are saying that by fMRI, by measuring basal cerebral volume as an index of neuronal resting activity and as an index of metabolism of neuron in this area, the aspartic acid is increasing the metabolism of this region. And then we try to say, but behind of this hypermetabolism, what's going on? And by using a Golgi staining, two girls in uh, our lab, Daniela Vitucci and uh, Marta Squillace, did uh, an amazing work of six months, and they measured the effects in terms of morphological changes associated with the one month oral administration of the aspartato. And we observed that the effect of such increased metabolism were associated to the fact that the aspartate increased the total dendritic length, increased the spiny density, and most interesting, it's increasing also the intersection and the complexity between neurons. The same effect was found in a mutant. And again, we move from mouse to human. And this experiment performed in collaboration with the professor Bertolini, now director at, of Roche of of, uh, uh, Roche, of Roche in Switzerland, we found the existence of uh, a gene variant that predict a different mRNA expression of DDO. This gene variant was evaluated on 268 post-mortem brain of healthy subject. And this prediction say that uh, the CC genotype predict for a lower DDO mRNA expression. And accordingly, by analyzing healthy volunteers, 160, we found that uh, in healthy volunteers, uh, we find that uh, associated with the same genotype, we observe an increase in the gray matter concentration, something that resembles to what's seen in the, in the animals treated with the aspartate. So we are replicating in human the effect, the trophic effect seen in the mouse. And what's it's interesting that uh, this increase in the gray matter concentration was also mirrored by increased brain activity under working memory task. So, I finish in the just one second. But why? But why nature? Why nature has created a gene coding for the aspartate oxidase? Why? Because this enzyme, by removing its substrate, attenuate cognitive performance. Why nature create a gene that induce an increased vulnerability to schizophrenia? Why nature do that? To answer to this question, we just move on on aging brain. And we decide to analyze the effects, not at three, four months, but we go through the aging. And what we see, fascinating data, we see that these mice, as said before, were smarted, were smarter at four months of age. But later on, they, devo they develop an, ex an acceleration in cognitive decay. 
And the phenotype observed here is so severe that it's indistinguishable when compared to an Alzheimer disease animal model. So we are saying, we are saying that more the aspartate is good, but too much is bad. And to prove what I said, the bimodal effect on cognition was perfectly mirrored by my bimodal increase in synaptic plasticity that at four months was higher the level of LTP. And uh, when we analyzed the animals at uh, 13, four months of age, when they were affected of cognitive defects, this announcement converted in a worsening of LTP. So this is the end. The ASP may be, may be good or maybe bad. This is my friends, my, it's not my group, my friends, my colleagues, my collaborators, and uh, Francesco, Francesco and Francesco, they are really the, the monster of the lab. Uh, the girls are special, and so we have a good environment. And uh, the, the, the acknowledgement, it's very important. So this is the list of the people that I mentioned during this study. I would like to remind uh, Tommaso Russo and Silvia Parisi because they have uh, some mystery that it's very important to be unveiled as soon as possible. Sabatino Maglione, uh, his colleague uh, Livio Luongo, for experiment uh, more in detail in terms of morphological uh, investigation related to brain aging and the precocious effect of brain aging. And uh, I would like uh, <coughs> to thank uh, Lorenzo for methylation studies, uh, Geppino e De Felice for the generation of new model, and uh, Frances Franco Salvatore and uh, is brilliant uh, Valeria D'Argenio for NGI study on DDO, but sorry, I would like to say grazie, grazie, grazie Franco for everything, for everything. <laughs> Scusa ritardo, scusami. Question for Dr. Viello. I don't understand, sorry. Are you planning to suggest us to drink aspartate, at least starting from uh, one age? I mean, I, I, and, and, uh, are you drinking aspartate? Okay, allora, uh, if it's, it, this is not a joke. Uh, I mean, uh, the question is very serious, and it's so serious that uh, there are running two independent experiments. One during aging, one in schizophrenia patients, and one mm, very, very, very easy to do that is just to get the aspartate when uh, we are feeling that our ready abilities are a little bit less strong. But uh, it's safe. It's safe. At least for a short period. Okay, last question, please. Uh, very fascinating data and very promising. Uh, for neurologists and the psychiatrists, of course. Um, I was wondering <coughs> whether or not we have idea where uh, the aspartate is capable of binding receptor, which is the subunit which is more involved, and uh, whether or not there is possibility to be transformed by methylation in the N-methyl aspartate. You understand my question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, first, um, f the first uh, uh, Dino is that I didn't show that, uh, of course, the the experiment uh, with the PATH application were very, very preliminary compared what we have done later. Indeed, by patch clamp application, we test uh, each subunit and we demonstrate that the aspartic acid bind and activate N2 B subunits. This is the first question. Uh, about us, uh, about, uh, this is another question. Uh, we also showed uh, with the Nicoletti that. Uh, the aspartate uh, in, uh, is able to activate metabotropic MGLUR5 receptor. This is what and we directly, showed. I suppose. Directly. I suppose. Directly, yeah. oh really? Directly. And the other question about uh, the methylation of the aspartate. Exist the possible methylation. Yeah, yeah no, again, uh, it's another very good, it's a very another good question. Indeed, uh, uh, as you really get the point, uh, the aspartic acid represents the substrate 
where a methylase add the methyl group and the produce the unmethyl derivative. But considering the concentration, the relative concentration, and the affinity on NMD receptor, uh, we can easily exclude that the glutamatergic effect on NMD receptor itself are mediated by the conversion of the aspartase on NMD. We don't rule out that a kind of contribution can occur, but surely it's not the main action especially because the time required it's longer it's uh, it's uh, shorter to what we observe under immediately time point thank you very much sorry for interrupting so last speaker is uh, lucio pastore of change and he will uh, speak about development of innovative therapy gene therapy and beyond mm -hmm. First of all, uh, I want to thank all of you uh, as survivors uh, after this very long and intense afternoon. Uh, you know, I want to reverse the thanking uh, now. Uh, after this long and intense afternoon, you're still here to listen to me, so I'm very proud of it. And, um, and second, obviously, I want to thank Franco, not for the invitation, but for the chat we had around 2000 when I was a junior faculty at Baylor, and he talked to me about change and... Uh, and I've been part of this adventure for the past years, and uh, I've had a lot from change. I hope I contributed a little bit, and uh, I hope to con that this adventure will continue for some more time. So I will talk about uh, genetic disorders that are actually now uh, of interest, um, have, have always been of interest in biomedical research, from gene starting from gene discovery uh, to the development of novel therapeutic approaches. Uh, most of the genetic disorders falls in the category of uh, uh, rare diseases. Um, uh, let's give some fact about rare diseases. Basically, rare diseases affect uh, diseases considered rare and affects uh, less than 200,000 people in the U.S. population. Um, uh, up to now, about 7,000 diseases are considered rare, and in the U.S., there are about uh, 250 new uh, rare diseases per year. Sooner or later, they've got to stop. But um, considering what we see, for example, in some mental retardations, uh, sometimes you see that uh, every patient has his own disease. So uh, this can be considered rare diseases. Um, and, uh, but overall, rare diseases affect 25 to 30 million patients in the U.S. And the overall cumulative prevalence of rare diseases is actually an astonishing 10%. So uh, it's very high prevalence. Um, now, why rare diseases are starting to matter to big pharmaceutical companies? First of all, the number of approved drugs is declining. This is a phenomenon that is starting over m a number of years. And uh, secondly, uh, patents expire much faster than they're being replaced by new patents. Uh, orphan drugs are definitely treated differently in many aspects. So uh, especially because price can be extremely high. So that, that's why orphan drugs, they're definitely attracting investors because basically there are fewer dots to market approvals. Uh, orphan drug, they also have a longer exclusivity, basically seven years versus five years. And uh, the uptake into the clinical practice is usually faster. It's, uh, the, the reimbursement policies are usually uh, favorable. And uh, as, I say, as I mentioned before, the pricing can be fairly high. And finally, there are low in marketing costs and also lower probabilities of development of genetic. For example, if we consider an antibodies, uh, the development of a biosimilar is uh, rather difficult and, we, and they have to basically, who develops a biosimilar, they have to go uh, through efficacy evaluation. And so it has, it has to start all over again. Uh, also in the development of these kind of drugs, basically there are some advantages as, such as tax credit, grants, reduced fees, uh, as I said, shorter development timelines, and usually a greater approval rates. And in the past year, basically, the blockbuster model of a pharmaceutical company, uh, or mainly the development of a drug that, uh, whose, uh, which, uh, whose revenues are over $1 billion uh, over the lifetime, is not actually that. But as you can see from this slide, basically, uh, orphan drugs are entering the world of blockbuster models or blockbuster drugs. So basically, the model is, is present, but pharma industry is looking for novel areas. And for example, we can see that the, the second most profitable drug in 2011 is actually an orphan drug. 
And one other statistic that I'd like to point out is that, that some of these drugs are compounds that are fairly common, like acetylcysteine, glutamine, or tripan blue, which are basically, they, they conquer the status of orphan drug be because of the orphan application. And basically, this orphan status makes this drug no, um, uh, again commercially viable. So let's go back to genetic diseases. Basically, there are um, different ways to uh, develop drugs for genetic diseases. First, one uh, or way is gene therapy. Basically, it's very straightforward. You have a mutation, you re replace it with the, the correct version of the gene. But uh, manufacture of gene therapy products, are, it's usually a problem. And uh, um, only lately, in the last few years, promises have been fulfilled for gene therapy. But they still represent always a great model for developing novel drugs. Other important relevant drugs for genetic diseases are based on antibodies and RNA-based drugs. And uh, there is agreement that these are, uh, this is a class of drug that is definitely very, very promises for promising, promising for a number of applications also because can be manufactured um, at much lower costs compared to, um, uh, to gene therapy products. And finally, there are small molecules that uh, have the advantage of low-cost manufacture, but uh, they definitely are usually less specific uh, than uh, the previously mentioned drug. So I'll talk a bit about gene therapy because it's what I've been doing for the past years. So if, you, if we look at the gene therapy statistics by application, we can see that most of the applications are on cancer diseases. And this is fairly obvious. This is... Um, the, let's say because of the prevalence and because of, of the interest. But let's say that the second, uh, second most frequent application are still monogenic diseases, so rare diseases. And if we look at the vectors used, uh, despite the fact that there has been uh, a lot of promising efforts in the development of non-viral vectors, we can see that adenoviral vectors are still the vectors that are mainly used for uh, gene therapy trial. So that's what I'm, been, I'm going to talk about si also because I've done a lot of experience in this field. Adenoviruses are a family of viruses, family of adenoviride. Basically, it's a, it's a vector with, um, that contains a double-strand DNA of 36 KB, and uh, it's classified in six subgroups. Uh, adenovirus 5 is the most commonly used in uh, gene therapy. Uh, adenoviral vectors are, usual, are usually divided in three uh, generations of vector. First generation when usually a transgene is just in the E1 region that has been this deleted. Uh, the second generation vector where there are more region deleted. And finally, the gutless or helper dependent vector that I've been working on since their uh, first development that are actually uh, completely devoid of uh, um, uh, the noviral open reading frame. They contain only the signals necessary in CIS for the packaging and the replication of the DNA. After the adenovirus administration, there are three types of toxicity. And immediate toxicity, that it's basically an inflammatory reaction due to mostly to the capsid of the vectors. And early toxicity, the, which is an hepa uh, hepatitis and coagulopathy, that it's partly due to the capsid, partly uh, to the accumulation of viral products, and a late toxicity that is a CDL or antibody response against virus infected cells or, or the transgene, and also is due to the accumulation of viral proteins. To prevent adenovirus induced response, and especially in the innate response, which actually led to the death of a patient in uh, 1999, there have been a number of uh, strategies, one of which is the pretreatment of the patient with immunomodulation and immunosuppression corticosteroids, cyclosporin, or you name the kind of immunosuppressive drugs. Or vector modification, such as the use of helper-dependent vector, but also chemical modification. And uh, back in 2004, we started to work uh, together with Maria Crowell at the University of Texas Austin, who actually came to, uh, to change for a summer uh, to uh, learn how to make uh, viral vectors and to teach us how to pegylate them. We started to work on pegylation of this therapeutic vectors. We basically, what we do is we uh, use activated PEG and uh, we make it react with the uh, lysines that are on the, uh, on the virion, on the adenovirus capsid. Um, there are about 18,000 lysines on the capsid and can be saturated at different percentages with different size of PEG. Um, uh, we use a particular type of pegylation, but there are many type of pegylation that can be used for different purposes. After uh, using this pegylated vector, we demonstrated in mice that basically uh, measuring IL-6, IL-12, and TNF-alpha 
six hours after vector administration, we demonstrated that basically, uh, if the vector is pegylated, we obtain a much lower increase in these cytokines that are usually the markers for the inflammatory reaction. And if you look at these slides, basically, uh, you notice that uh, more than the helper dependent versus the first generation vector is the pegylated versus non pegylated that makes the difference. So the fact that we shield the capsid of the vector and makes it unrecognizable to macrophages and to the immune system. And this is actually one of the first work that we made a change in 2005 with Maria Croy. And uh, the reduction on in the cytokines, it's also um, accompanied by the reduction of, of in these platelet drops, that it's something that has been observed I I acutely after adenovirus administration. Um, since mice are a good model, but not good enough to uh, go to men, uh, to men, we performed the same experiment in baboons at, the, at San Antonio, and uh, um, we observed basically the same results. We published it in 2011. And we noticed the pegylated vector basically have a much lower increase in interleukin-6 and TNF-alpha. And this was mirrored also by a reduction of, of, of a cytotoxicity. Um, if, you, if you see the, the highest dose uh, of the helper dependence, you see an increase in the first hours after the administration of LDH, while if you see the same dose of pegylated vector, you have much lower increase compared to the, um, co compared to the um, animal treated with the pegylated form. So after demonstrating the reduced toxicity of this vector, we went on and we tried to demonstrate if this vector were good to correct the pathologic phenotype. And we went to APOE1 delivery in a, a, mo a model of familial hypercholesterolemia, LDA receptor deficient mice. And uh, to demonstrate that it's safe, basically we did the same thing. At six hours, we administered uh, vectors, um, the uh, helper dependent vectors expressed in APOE1 and their pegylated version. And as you can notice from these slides, and I'm not gonna go through all these panels, basically you always see that there's a reduction in the cytokine increase when you use the pegylated form. This side, the reduction of cytokine increase does not uh, provoke a reduction on the, in the efficacy. In fact, APOE1 is still very well expressed and cholester HDL cholesterol is increased in mice transmitted with either pegylated or non-pegylated vector. And most importantly, aortic catalosclerosis performed with an emphasis technique demonstrated a reduction of aortic catalosclerosis both in, peg in mice treated with naive helper dependent vector or pegylated helper dependent vector. So uh, the conclusion from this part of the experiment is that basically pegylated vectors are definitely inducing a milder um, inflammatory response. Uh, they uh, still infect uh, efficiently a pathocyte that is still able to um, induce expression of our transgene and especially are able to correct pathologic phenotypes. And now, lately, we started to work on another different project that uh, might lead to uh, a different kind of administration. And it's more uh, related to the use of gene therapy, more as a model than as a therapy, a therapeutic strategy. Basically, we started to use this uh, chimeric protein for therapy of LDR receptor deficiency. We know that in familiar hypercholesterolemia, the problem is the increase of, L of LDL in the serum. What we, um, uh, what we generated basically in collaboration with Stefano Ferrari was the first one to generate this type of molecule. And uh, actually the project um, uh, has been interrupted for a, um, a number of years due to the fact that unfortunately uh, Stefano Ferrari passed away a while ago. And so the, the project had been stopped for a while. Uh, basically, um, the, the, the protein that we use is a protein that has the extracell extracellular part of the LDR receptor uh, um, uh, linked to um, basically to transferrin. And uh, the transferrin portion of the complex uh, di directs the whole LDL chimeric protein complex towards the transferrin receptor and uh, gets endocytosed uh, through, or th uh, uh, through this kind of receptor. And actually, Stefano Ferrari has already demonstrated that this kind of protein um, is able to internalize LDL cholesterol, uh, both in tissue culture and in vivo. And so um, we decided to start to, start to use this, this approach. Uh, he, he used it in vivo with the hydrodynamic injection of the plasmid. So basically what we was able to see, not a decrease of LDL levels, but only an increase of uptake in the liver of labeled, iodine labeled LDL. What we did is basically make an helper-dependent adenoviral vector expressed in this protein, 
And we tested first in vitro, showing that cells infected can actually um, uptake the chimeric protein. This is an antibodies against transferrin can uptake the, 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 the chimeric protein that goes into the cytoplasm. But most importantly, and these are cells that are LDL receptor deficient, uh, cells can actually endocytose uh, uh, LDL, and these are the coded vesicles that uh, you, can, uh, you can actually see after um, when the cells are treated with this vector. But most importantly, after uh, so this preliminary in vitro <coughs> experiment, we decided to do a very, very small preliminary in vivo experiment with five mice per group using a very low dose, which is five times 10 to the 11 virus particle per kilogram. Uh, consider that we can go as high as one times 10 to the 13 via particle per kilogram. So we can use a 20 fold higher doses and these are not even pegylated vectors. And you can see a decrease in cholesterol in treated animals compared to untreated animals. Um, most of these, um, these results are very preliminary so we don't have a lot of uh, uh, other characterization but it's uh, definitely very promising for a number of reasons. First of all, because it's clear that we can express this chimeric protein and it's able to be efficiently secreted, uptaken by the transfer receptor, bind LDL, reduce total cholesterol in LDL receptor deficient animals. It's uh, transgene, in this case, transgene production from hepatocyte, it's not an absolute requirement. Basically, we can transduce, we don't have to uh, do in, uh, intravenous administration, but we can also uh, do subcutaneous or intramuscular administration and expect that if the transgene go into the blood, it goes into the bloodstream, is able to redirect the uh, LDR, LDR receptor uh, complex to, to the liver. And also, one additional thing that is the most interesting, it's been demonstrated that uh, protein, uh, ca transferring chimeric proteins can be absorbed through the intestine. And this has been de demonstrated with the growth hormone transferring chimeric protein. And this makes a, um, this approach even more interesting for the possibility to actually produce the transgene and um, do an uh, oral administration of, of the vector or, the, or either the transgene. Of course, uh, some of this development that we've been doing uh, with pegylated vectors requires strategic partnership. And re um, regarding the development of the pegylated vector for gene therapy of rare diseases, obviously uh, it's important to have a, uh, an academic uh, research and development production site that actually is being built a change and obviously the, it's important to have an accurate choice of target that might, uh, this experiment the, uh, which are proof of concept might not be uh, the, uh, the best target to go in vivo to go into a human trial. But pegylation is a technology that it's fairly interesting for a number of other reasons. And in fact, uh, different types of pegylations are interesting for the development of vaccines and oncolytic vectors. And for this application, we're, partner uh, we're actually partnering with Transgene, which is a, a multinational company based in France and with the University of Helsinki for the development of these novel approaches. And finally, I'd like to thank all the people involved in, this, uh, in these studies over the years. Um, uh, I would like to mention especially people in my group, Eleonora Leggero, who's been the gene therapy arm of my laboratory, and Barbara Lombardo, whose uh, help and friendship has been fundamental over the years. Franco, I've been thanked before, and all the other collaborators. Thank you. Thank you.